What if what you believe about the Antichrist is absolutely wrong? His age, his lineage, how to calculate his number 666? Is he loved? Is he known? Does he have supernatural power? Tim Cohen, on our last interview, you did an amazing job proving the identity of the antichrist but people had objections and there's false claims about the antichrist and we want to go through those and for those who haven't seen the other interview here is a picture of what the interview is and you need to see that exposed who the antichrist really is okay tim let's start with people say you know Prince Charles is not really loved. They say William is loved, so he should be the Antichrist. And they say that Charles' approval rating is not really, really high, but that William's is high. So what do you say about that? So biblically, we're not uh, supposed to guess on this issue concerning who the Antichrist is, Janie. Scripture gives us specific criteria and being loved is actually not one of those. The world will follow after the beast, according to Revelation 13, the first beast of that chapter, whom a lot of Christians understand to be the Antichrist, the person who will be over a global government for three and a half years during the Great Tribulation. They'll follow after that individual after he receives a mortal wound and recovers from it. But there's nothing about him being loved prior to that or in relation to that. Uh, it's not a criteria. We have to go by the biblical criteria. And Charles is the only person in history, as we talked about in the prior interview, who meets those criteria. The only criterion whom William or Harry, uh, in fact, any other person in the world could potentially meet at this point, is the lineage. And generally, that's pretty restrictive as well. So William and Harry have the lineage that Charles has. That isn't even an explicit biblical criteria. People think about the Antichrist in terms of lineage, and they say, well, he's probably going to be a descendant of King David to fool Israel into thinking he's the Messiah. Or maybe he'll be a descendant of Muhammad to fool the world's Muslims into thinking that he's their Mahdi, their, their equivalent, if you will, to a so-called Messiah. In other words, they'll, they'll put that criteria in there. It's not a bad criteria, but it's not an explicit biblical one. That being said, Charles meets all these criteria. So if we wanted to use that as a criterion, we could say that William and Harry certainly meet that one. But there is literally no other biblical criterion who either of them meets, and therefore they are not qualified to be the Antichrist scripturally. And a lot of people have been hearing this notion of William because there are some individuals who read my book, the first edition when it came out in 1998, the Antichrist right. Captivity. They read it. They were interested in Charles. They figured all this time, well, he's getting older. He's getting up there in years. He hasn't uh, taken control of a global government yet. Oh, Maybe yeah. No, people are saying sons. that. Yeah, people have been saying, oh, he's sick. Uh, he has heart trouble. He's going to die soon. <laughs> yeah, and there's no evidence for that either. It's just a rumor, you know, kind of like people previously saying, well, you know, maybe Elizabeth, his mother, will cede the throne to William. And that was a real possibility. I wouldn't have ruled that one out. You know, maybe she'll cede the throne to William and just bypass Charles. That was realistically unlikely because Charles had been groomed for his entire life for decades and decades to be on the throne of the UK. But moreover, as I point out in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, and I didn't actually necessarily think he'd ever you know, be on the throne before the tribulation week and the great tribulation came along and occurred. I figured he might very well probably would remain Prince of Wales, but now he's on the throne. The fact of the matter is though that they had intended for him to be on the throne from at least 1969 at the time of his investiture. And we can see that in the helm, the version of the gold helm that's on his heraldic achievement, his coat of arms that was granted to him and first shown to the world in July of 1969 when he was invested as Prince of Wales. That particular helm is the sovereign helm. It's not just any helm. So for example, when Elizabeth went from being princess to queen, Charles' mother, her coat of arms was modified, and one of the modifications made to it was to change the helm from that that might go with a princess, for example, to the sovereign helm. Well, Charles was given the sovereign helm from the start, even as Prince of Wales, meaning they always intended for him to be on the throne, at least from July of 69. So that, and I would say obviously earlier, because it took years to create his coat of arms, even though the world, world only first saw it. Right. And you had pointed out in the other interview that the, his coat of arms, it describes the imagery of the Antichrist from the scriptures. So, yes, that's one of the criteria we talked about in the prior interview. It's on the cover 
of the Antichrist and Capitibo. So the 1998 first edition, the second edition that goes to press this year. I showed you a, a draft and you showed your audience a draft of the cover of the second edition uh, in our prior interview, which uh, has on it his heraldic achievement, Charles, which is unique to him under international law. It's not something that can be contrived. You know, some people have thought that because there are actually laws, national and international, that pertain to heraldry. And in the case of a royal coat of arms, they'll take some of the symbols of the father's heraldic achievement or coat of arms, if he has one, some of the mothers, if she has one, they'll combine them into a unique coat of arms and add specific unique symbolism or individual uh, devices for the person to whom they're granting the coat of arms to create something that's absolutely unique to them historically and under international law. No one else can ever have anything like it. That necessarily means that, for example, William and Harry, they don't have that imagery on their heraldic achievements, which have already been granted to both of them, by the way. So they're, they're in the public domain. People can go see William's coat of arms. They can see Harry's. There is an error, I'll warn people on Wikipedia, where Charles' coat of arms is being conflated with William's. You need a better source than Wikipedia on this. At any rate, uh, on Charles' heraldic achievement, his coat of arms, you have a beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion. So like, like, like is what we read about in Revelation 13. It's a simile. In other words, it's not actually the mouth of a lion, actually the body of a leopard, actually the feet of a bear. The scripture says it's like, like, like. So this is the thing that's invoked in our minds. This is what we are reminded of when we see that beast on Charles for all the achievement. But that is what it looks like, a beast with feet like a bear, proportions like the proportions of a body uh, of a leopard's body, a mouth resembling the mouth of a lion. Then in addition to that, Revelation 13 tells us that a red dragon, red and it's called fiery red and identified as Satan in Revelation 12. And then Revelation 13, that very same dragon gives this beast that has feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, his power thrown in great authority. So that was granted to Charles as Prince of Wales. He has that actual imagery, including the red dragon on his heraldic achievement. He was facing that dragon when the coronet was placed on his head to coronate him Prince of Wales, and his mother, who put the coronet on his head, was also facing that dragon, and both of them were encircled by that dragon, which was hung on huge white banners with tassels beneath them on the walls of Cairn Arbon, Ca Cairn Arbon Castle, where the investiture happened in July of 69. Both the interior walls and the exterior walls of the castle had those banners hanging on them. So in 19... 53, uh, Wales adopted the red dragon as its national symbol, the same one, which is identified as Satan in scripture. In 1958, the queen announced she would uh, create Charles, Prince of Wales. So she had created him at that point, Prince of Wales. And then years later, she would present him to the Welsh people and formally invest him as Prince of Wales. That happened 11 years later in July of 1969. So when the queen put the coronet on his head to coronate him Prince of Wales, she literally coronated, print, coronated him Prince of the Red Dragon or Satan's Prince. They were both facing the Red Dragon. He was made Prince of Wales. Wales was represented by the symbol of Satan at that point in time and still is to this day. So he became Prince of the Red Dragon. When Charles later recounted who put the coronet on his head, he said, my father put it on my head. My father Ooh. invested me. Ooh. And yet the entire world to, to this day can go back and see it was his mother who did it. What <gasps> in the world was he talking about? Which and the red father? dragon was also, yeah, the red dragon was also in, engraved on the backrest of the throne, a gray Welsh slate throne from which the queen stood up to put the coronet on Charles' head. And he was literally facing through her that engraved dragon on the backrest of her throne, the dragon of Wales, and literally right behind it were huge red dragon banners on the castle walls that he was directly facing. And in back of him, directly in front of the queen, as she was facing Charles, were more huge red dragon banners that she was facing. So he was literally invested as Satan's prince. That being said, he has the imagery that's there in Revelation 13. So this is the rub with regard to William and Harry. And this is why I go into this explanation. One of the rubs. Yes, they have the lineage, but they don't have that imagery that's on Charles' coat of arms. And it's not optional. The reason it's not optional is not only because of that introductory portion of Revelation chapter 13, but when we get to verse 18, where it actually instructs us or him who has a wisdom, somebody, to do the name calculation, it, says, it starts out, here is wisdom, let him who has understanding 
calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. In other words, before we can legitimately attempt to do the calculation, that beast imagery has to be present for a man. If the imagery isn't there for that man, forget doing the calculation. It doesn't matter what you produce or, or, or can contrive or can come up with. Even if you're using the real system, it makes no difference. If the imagery isn't there for that person, they're not the Antichrist. Period. Right. So it doesn't really matter if you go, oh, this person's loved. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter at all. And so, so that's one thing. And there's, there's got to be the imagery and then there's got to be the name calculation. Charles has both. William and Harry have neither. Now, people have done this weird thing with William's name on the internet. They've gone, Will, I am, and tried to segment uh, his name and say, well, somehow that represents 666 on a contrived system. So there, there are multiple issues with that. One is we're not free to tamper with the name, and we don't have to if we do the calculation biblically. The system that we're supposed to use to do the calculation is not something we're supposed to invent or contrive either. It's actually identified for us in the Greek text from which Revelation 13, 18 is translated. So the original scripture, the inspired word of God, tells us what system we're supposed to use because the system itself is what is used to specify 666, the number in Revelation 13, 18. So there's one letter that represents 600 a second letter in Greek that represents 60, and a third letter in Greek that represents six. And that's how they get 666. Almost all the numbers in Scripture in the New Testament are written out in the form of Greek words. There are only a couple I know about off the top of my head that are not. One is the 144 for the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. If you look in the Greek text, 144 is specified using that same system that's identified in Revelation 13, 18, but elsewhere in Revelation. So it's used for that number. It's also used for 666 in Revelation 13, 18. It happens to be the ancient Kabbalic numbering system, the, the Hebrew numbering system that was used before we had words for numbers that was used to specify numbers in the Hebrew. It's that system as it was applied to the Greek language. And it was applied sequentially, not phonetically. And that's an important thing. The fact that the number, the system was applied sequentially you know, like we have A, B, C, D, E, we have a sequence to our letters in the English language. Same thing with Hebrew. It's Aleph, Bet, you know, right? All the way down. 22 uh, glyphs in Hebrew. There are 26 letters in the English language. So at some point we cut it off with W, X, Y, and Z in English. But the point is it's a sequential system. And when it was applied to Greek, it was applied sequentially. And then they expanded the system to include 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, and so forth, because Greek has even more characters than Hebrew and English both. So they got a complete set of numbers up through 900 in the Greek version of the system. It's that version that's specified there in uh, Revelation 13, 18. So number one, we have the system identified for us. Number two, we're not free to contrive or invent one. Number three, the title Charles Prince of Wales in English, when you take that same system from the original Hebrew and you apply it sequentially, but if you cut it off at W through Z because there are only 22 numbers in the original system in Hebrew. The title, Charles, Prince of Wales, works out to exactly 666. If that's all we had mathematically, you know, when you're talking about probabilities, that's close to impossible. The exact same title, Charles, Prince of Wales, in modern Hebrew, using the original system, okay, the original Hebrew system that was transferred to the Greek, the original Hebrew numbering system, the title, Charles, Prince of Wales, in modern he Hebrew, Nasik, Charles, of Wales, calculates to exactly 666. No tampering. And so all of a sudden, what we're faced with is the same title by which Charles was known globally until very recently, calculating to 666 in at least two languages on the biblical numbering system identified in the Greek text of Revelation 13, 18. Mathematically, we are in the territory of that being literally impossible at that point. The odds are so low, you can legitimately say it's not possible, yet it's fact. On top of that, this is in the context of the imagery on his coat of arms. Right. There are so many objections that people have that you can answer, Tim. So I want people to stay tuned because people still have, they have false 
ideas about what the Antichrist is going to be. So we're going to be going through a lot of them. And it's pretty amazing. It's going to change your mindset because you're going to see, wait a minute, what was I believing? Was it biblical or was it not? Now, another thing that people say, they're saying, well, isn't the Antichrist supposed to be revealed after the rapture? Uh, you know, that's a common error, and it's an error because there is no such thing as a pre-tribulational rapture in Scripture. There's not a mid-tribulational rapture either in Scripture. There's not even a pre-wrath rapture in Scripture. There is a rapture, however. So Scripture is more sophisticated in the way that it presents to us future details, and people want to take a simplistic approach. It is, however, as I pointed out in our first interview, very easy to prove biblically that the rapture is post-tribulational. And we can go way past simple statements like what Christ said when he said, yeah, you know, those who are in the world who serve him will have tribulation, right? And if you don't have tribulation, you're not a legitimate son. If you're not chastised, in other words, in this world in some form, if God doesn't allow that, you know, people bring that up who are post-tribulations and they say, well, see, we're going to have tribulation. Other things that people will bring up is, why are we any different? Why should we be than any other generation in history than, or than countless Christians around the world who are being martyred to this, to, you know, right now as we're talking, who are being murdered, who are being persecuted for their faith. Okay. Uh, right, but, but let me just different? say this. Let me just say this. It says in the Bible, it says the Antichrist cannot be revealed unless he who holds him back is taken out of the way. So I think they use that, you know, that scripture. Yeah, I'm going to address both those things okay. in my answer here. So, but the bottom line is I have under the comments that people look at the very first comments I posted under our original interview. In other words, they show them by the date, not the most recent, the date given. They'll see up toward the top where I have answered the issue of pre-tribulationism versus post, et cetera, very briefly. I have a whole, a whole teaching on that called The Real Rapture that's based on a whole volume in my upcoming Messiah History and the Tribulation Period series that goes into great detail on this. But very simply, very simply, the rapture occurs in three stages biblically. The first two individuals to be raptured are the two witnesses. They're killed in the same hour that the last trumpet starts to sound, that seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation, and they're resurrected. In, uh, excuse me, they're resurrected in the same hour that starts to sound. They lie dead for days in the street before that. This is Revelation 11, verses 10 to 15. In the same hour that the seventh trumpet in Revelation begins to sound, they are resurrected, and after that, they are caught up to meet a voice in the clouds above them that says, come up here, they're raptured. After them, the 144,000 sealed Israelites appear on Mount Sinai with Yeshua, with the Lamb. He's the Lamb. They appear there with him to sing the song of the Lamb, the song of the Moses, and a new song that only they can learn. That's the start of Revelation chapter 14. The fact that they can appear there with Yeshua implies that they've been gathered. So we know they've been raptured. They've been gathered to Christ to appear there at Mount Zion. At, uh, uh, Mount Zion pardon me. The third stage of the rapture comes after the nations begat, begin to gather for the Battle of Armageddon. And that's in Revelation chapter 16. And how do we know that? Here's the proof, by the way, one proof, and I offer several, but this is one very simple proof from Scripture that people have missed, and pre-tribulationists, for example, will ignore, that the rapture is post-tribulational, unambiguously so. So every pre-tribulationist has been taught that the Lord is coming back as a thief in the night, and Yeshua himself says that he will come as a thief in the night. And the way that pre-tribulationists will typically interpret that is they'll say, well, that means that uh, we won't see him coming. We won't have prior signs. We won't know in advance that he's about to come. And in fact, people will wax eloquent on this if you want to put it that way and say, well, you know, the rapture will only be known to the world by the fact that uh, Christians are suddenly gone. They're suddenly disappeared from the planet. Okay. That's how it's typically related, this phrase, thief in the night, to pre-tribulationists. There's a huge problem with that, though, and that is that Christ explicitly tells us in Scripture, it's written in Scripture, he tells us when he is coming as a thief in the night. You folks, you've never heard this before from a pre-tribulationist teacher anywhere on the planet. You haven't heard it from a mid-tribulationist, and in fact, to my shock and dismay, you also haven't heard it from post-tribulationists. I'm the only post-tribulationist in the world in history, to my knowledge, to actually bring this up, but I've been teaching this for decades. So here it is, Revelation 16, the seven bowls of wrath. 
Even pre-tribulationists will say, and they're correct on this point, so listen to this, they will say that the bulls of wrath are either post-tribulational events, right after the tribulation week ends, or they're at the very end of the tribulation week. And the reason they'll say that is because it's with the sixth bowl of wrath that the nations begin to gather for the battle of Armageddon, and there's no pre-tribulationist who thinks that they can get away with saying to the church or to the saints, hey, maybe the battle of Armageddon will have a gathering before the tribulation period starts, right? They know that the, that the battle of Armageddon is at the end of the tribulation week, minimally, or it's right after the tribulation week ends, and therefore, the bowls of wrath, they will admit, are at the end of the tribulation week or right after the tribulation week. So here's the issue. With the fifth bowl of wrath, the kingdom of the beast is cast into physical darkness. That's the fifth bowl. That's starting with Revelation chapter 16, verse 10. How big is the kingdom of the beast? Well, in Revelation 13, when that global government commences under the Antichrist, it becomes something that involves the whole world, right? The government under the Antichrist, it's the whole world. Right, all the nations, over. all mm -hmm. tribes, tongues, and nations are following after this person when he begins his global reign, right? This Antichrist, the Antichrist. So for three and a half years, that global government is the world. It's compassing the whole world. That being said, if in verse 10 of Revelation 16, the kingdom of the beast is cast into darkness, and this is at the end of that three and a half year period of the Antichrist global reign, then it's the whole world that's cast into darkness, right? Nobody's going to argue that point. No pre-tribulationist can argue that point. Pre-tribulationists know that the reign of the Antichrist is three and a half years long, they know it's global. Therefore, if in Revelation 16, verse 10, with the fifth bowl of wrath, the world is cast, the kingdom of the beast is cast into darkness, that means the globe, the planet, is in physical darkness at that point. Okay, nobody's going to argue that point now that I've laid it out that way. All of a sudden, though, when we get to the sixth bowl of wrath, starting in verse 15 of Revelation 16, so the next thing that happens after the world is in physical darkness, we see a few things happen under the sixth bowl. We see three unclean spirits go out of the mouth of the devil, Satan, go out of the mouth of the Antichrist. That's Charles, as we're going to say. And as I pointed out in our prior interview, he is the Antichrist, Prince Charles, now King Charles III. And then the third unclean spirit, like a frog, goes out of the mouth of the false prophet. What do they do? They go to gather the nations to the Battle of Armageddon, right? What's the next thing that Revelation 16 under the sixth bowl of wrath tells us happens as the nations begin to gather from the battle of Armageddon? There's a statement there suddenly. Christ says, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest they, meaning the unbelievers all around, see his shame. Okay, so here, listen to this again. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest they the unbelievers all around, see his shame, okay? Now go look that passage up. It's in Revelation 16, starting in verse 15 with a sixth bowl of wrath. So with a fifth bowl, the world is in physical darkness. The kingdom of the beast is. With a sixth bowl, the nations begin to gather for the battle of Armageddon. And then all of a sudden, Christ says, behold, I come as a thief. And the saints already have their garments. This is an important point. The resurrection or translation, you know, where we get our new bodies and our garments, right? has already happened. The rapture has not, but the saints already have their garments. So the general rapture has not, because Christ is about to come as a thief in the night. In context, in the night, the world is in physical darkness. He's about to come as a thief for the rest of the church. I've already said the two witnesses have been raptured already. The 144,000 have appeared on Mount Zion and been raptured already. Now the rest of the church is getting ready to be raptured. Christ says, behold, I come as a thief. That is undeniably a statement of Christ indicating he's coming as a thief in the night after the nations begin to gather for the battle of Armageddon, post-tribulationally. So, does it mean that there's a pre-tribulational coming of Christ as a thief in the night? No. And in fact, he tells us when he's going to do that, it's post-tribulational. When does the resurrection and translation happen? It happens the instant. That seventh trumpet, Revelation 10, verses 6 to 7, is where you'll find more details on that trumpet. The instant that trumpet starts to sound, and it sounds for a period of days, it's the literal Tekiah Haggadol, the great shofar of the day of trumpets. That is the seventh trumpet in Revelation. It is the only trumpet in the whole Bible 
that sounds for a period of days. It's also the only trumpet in Scripture that explicitly is blown by the Lord himself. The messenger in Revelation 10, verses 1 to 5, is Christ. It's the resurrected Christ. It's God incarnate. He, we see all the attributes of deity in Revelation 10, 1 to 5, attributed to that messenger. In other words, this is the angel of the Lord, the non-created angel who took on a human body and rose from the grave, died and rose from the grave. That's who this mighty messenger is in Revelation 10. And in verses 6 to 7, he announces, In the days of the voice of the sounding of the seventh angel, the messenger, in this case himself, he's speaking of himself, when, okay, in the days of the voice of the sounding of the seventh messenger, when he is about to sound or blow the trumpet, the mystery of God would be completed or finished as he preached the gospel to his bondservants, the prophets. That phrase, preach the gospel, is something preacher relations also will not have heard. Why not? Because it's omitted from almost every English translation, even though it's present literally in every Greek manuscript. <laughs> Why was it omitted? Because the devil has used this to trick the saints into thinking that such a thing as a pre-trib rapture is possible or a mid-trib rapture is possible. In other words, to trick the saints into thinking that that trumpet, that specific trumpet, that seventh trumpet in Revelation 10, is not the last trumpet. He, the devil is caused, for whatever reason, translators to omit that phrase, preach the gospel from verses 6 to 7, because if that phrase isn't there, then there's no explicit connection between that seventh trumpet in Revelation 10 and the gospels. Mm -hmm. In other words, people can divorce the trumpet that Christ spoke of on the Olivet Discourses that would attend his return from that trumpet in Revelation 10, that seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation. They can divorce that in their minds because then without that phrase, preach the gospel, they seem to be disconnected. When that phrase is there, we then have to ask as Christians, okay, it tells us right here, this particular trumpet was preached beforehand in the gospels. Where is it? In Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, where do we find it, right? The only trumpet that anyone can point to in the gospels, when we know that that seventh trumpet in Revelation 10 is somehow preached beforehand in the gospels, the only trumpet that can be pointed to is what Christ said in the Olivet Discourses in terms of the trumpet that would, would attend his return, right? As the angel of the Lord, who took on a human body, sacrificed that body for our sins, raised it from the grave to never die again. That's who that mighty messenger is in Revelation 10. It's Christ himself. It's Yeshua, the Messiah. So all that being stated, that seventh trumpet, the instant it starts to sound, though it sounds for a period of days, the saints get resurrected or translated the moment it starts to sound. But they're still on the earth. Almost an hour later, roughly, within that same hour, the two witnesses who've already been resurrected at that point, so that the whole world sees that they've been resurrected after they've lied dead in the street outside Jerusalem for days, they stand on their feet the moment that trumpet starts to sound, but it's almost an hour later that they're actually raptured. After them, the 144,000 are raptured to appear on Mount Zion with Christ. They're gathered by the Lord's angels. You know, he said he would send his angels to gather together the elect in the Olivet Discourses. That's the rapture, and it's post-tribulational. After all of them, and when the nations are gathering for the battle of Armageddon and the nation, the uh, world, pardon me, is in physical darkness, then Christ says, behold, I come as a thief. Then he's going to send his angels to gather the rest of the church. How do I know that? And this is important. There are two harvests at the end of Revelation chapter 14. The first harvest, and these are both events that happen after the 144,000 appear on Mount Zion with Yeshua, with the Lamb. After they're gathered to Mount Zion to appear there with him before Israel and in the midst of Israel, right? Then there are two harvests. The first harvest is the general rapture. It's the gathering of the rest of the church. That is what actually dovetails with, merges with the events right after the gathering for the battle of Armageddon there in Revelation 16. It happens right before the next harvest in Revelation 14. So the second harvest and Revelation 14 is actually the wine press of the Lord's wrath. It's actually Armageddon itself, and it dovetails with Revelation 19, where the sword goes forth in the Lord's mouth and slaughters the militaries of the nations there gathered against him under the Antichrist. So very simply, we have Christ coming as a thief in the night for the church at large, post-tribulationally, between Revelation 16, verses 10 to 15, the fifth 
and six bowls of wrath. Now that I've explained this, there's, explained this there's not a pre-tribulationist or a mid-tribulationist on the planet who could hear this. Go and examine those scriptures and then honestly, without lying, say that the rapture is pre-tribulational or that Christ is coming as the thief of the night for the saints pre-tribulationally. So I point all that out because, and this is extremely important. People, you have to get this. And you have to confront people at this point who are teaching pre-tribulationism with this. I stated more than two decades ago, in fact, I've been stating since the 1980s, when God showed me who the Antichrist is, when I first realized there wasn't a warm reception in the church to this knowledge, you know, that far back, that Charles was the Antichrist. I was presenting evidence to Messianic pastors back in 1987 that Charles was the Antichrist. And they mocked it. They wouldn't listen to it. They said, Charles, he's a goofball. Mm. They wouldn't take it seriously. They wouldn't even examine the evidence. They weren't honest about being a noble Berean, as scripture calls us to be. When I saw that, I realized, you know, after a while of being shocked by that kind of reaction, when people should be very excited to know this and realize this is hard evidence, proof that we're going to see the Lord's return soon because the Antichrist, who's prophesied in scripture, is literally walking among us today. And he was an adult man, already popular throughout the world. Mm. known throughout the entire world at that point already. In fact, in July 1969, when Charles was invested Prince of Wales, until he married Diana, he was literally touted in the press, the Western press all over the world, as the most eligible bachelor on the planet. <laughs> literally. You know, people say that about William today. But before <laughs> William, they were saying it about Charles for a long time. <laughs> and then he married Diana. So mm -hmm. anyway, coming back to what I'm saying, I was saying to people, because of the reaction I was getting that was not biblical and wasn't right before God, and was shocking to me, you know, with the level of evidence that I was actually able to present, meaning the imagery, the name calculation, the basic lineage, and we'll come back to the lineage. I was able to present all that in 1987, and then in early 1988, when the Lord provided me uh, a core piece of the evidence on the lineage, which is very critical. So still being mocked you know, presenting that level of evidence, which, you know, nobody could present for any human being in the history of the world to that point. Stunning literal evidence. I thought, okay, there's something very off spiritually going on here. But this means that the day will come when there'll be people saying, we're still here, so Charles can't be the Antichrist. Or saying, this can't be the mark of the beast because we're still here, okay? What this means is the day would come when people would say, you know, there's going to be a pre trib rapture, mid trib rapture. We can't know who the Antichrist is in advance, like they were already saying back then, right? Therefore, Charles can't be it. You just have to be wrong, Tim. You, you can't possibly be right because we're still here and the church isn't going to know who the Antichrist is because I've been taught the Lord's coming as a thief in the night, and that's how it is. Or they would say, this can't be the mark of the beast because we're still here. I think it's okay if I go take this mark because. We're still here. The rapture's going to pre happen pre-tribulationally. The, the mark's going to get implemented uh, under the Antichrist reign, and we're not even going to know who he is. We're not even going to be here. We can't be here when the mark's implemented. So mm -hmm. no, it might you might think this is the system, whatever, but no, uh, we can deceived. go use this. It's okay. Mm. They'll be deceived. So since you and I did our interview under the comments on that first video, and folks, you can go look at this. If you go, and there's thousands of comments at this point, but if you want to take the time, you can read through every one of them. You're going to see multiple comments from different people where they have literally said, Charles cannot be the Antichrist because we're still here. Or the rapture is pre-tribulational, so we can't know who the Antichrist is. Therefore, Charles can't be the Antichrist. In some cases, they've used the exact wording that I stated. And by the way, I'm not just saying I said this. I have a 2005 prophecy conference that's available through Prophecy House, my publisher, in which I stated this literally, in that conference, people can go listen to the DVDs or the CDs, and that's that, and will hear me say this in 2005. I'm not making this up. I've stated this for decades. I said it in 2002 to that same church. I said it again in 2010. I said it again in 2018. I've said it for decades. That being said, the mark of the beast, Janie, has been here also the entire time. And we've been using it to buy and sell also the entire time. I pointed that out as well in the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, and I knew that in 1987. The difference is it's not yet physically on your body, and you're not yet required to use it personally to buy and sell. Hmm. 
And that's the UPC and EAN barcode. It does, in fact, have three sixes on either end and in the middle, six, six, six. In every UPC and EAN barcode, EAN, so it's Europe, it's a universal product code or European article numbering. Okay, two names for the same thing. One used in the United States, UPC, the other used throughout Europe and the rest of the West, the EAN, but they're the same technically, technically they're exactly the same. So there's a guard bar, guard bar or security bar pattern in those codes where you're seeing descender bars, bars that descend halfway between the digits they show you on either end in the middle. Those three sets of bars where they're not showing you the digits, the numbers they represent beneath are all sixes. I've given evidence for that in the first edition, of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. There's much more in the second edition, yeah, but I've actually, there's so much on the issue of the Mark of the Beast that I wasn't able to get to in the first edition. It's now a separate book that'll be coming out right after uh, the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea on the Mark of the Beast for me giving all the evidence, including dealing with um, the other types of codes that are prominent now for buying and selling. But the bottom line is we've been using this on all the goods that are bought and sold throughout the United States and throughout the West and much of the world for decades, going back before 1987 even. And like, if people look at the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, there's no barcode on it. I wouldn't put one on it. I don't put one on anything that Prosyas offers, I don't allow it. When a third party distributor or seller wants to sell something like, let's say my book, North Korea Ran and the Coming World War, Behold Red Horse, they'll stick a sticker on it. That's what they did in the past. And that's what they did with the Antichrist and Cup of Tea when they bought it from Prosyas to resell. They'd put a barcode sticker on it. Now they put it on the cover when they're printing it. If they're doing print on demand, uh, Amazon does, but I don't provide the barcode. Prosyas doesn't, we won't do that. So that's my point. It's being used to buy and sell. It's on your uh, loyalty cards, folks, that you use at Costco, that you use at Kroger or King Supers, that you use at other places where you buy and sell to get a little discount. You might show them your loyalty card and they scan a barcode on it. It's on that card and you might hand it to them with your hand. It's in your hand when you do that. You shouldn't be doing that. I'm gonna tell you now, I never have for that reason. It's not the same as being permanently tattooed on your hand or forehead, maybe with invisible ink that the existing scanners can read. But my point to everyone is that day is coming, whether it's a UPC or EAN barcode or some successor to it that has three sixes in it, that day is coming. People will say, this can't be it. And the consequence will be, they'll choose that rather than starving or suffering deprivation. They'll take it and they will be condemned to hell. Yeah, Unless yeah. It's excised from the body, and God has mercy on them. Yeah, the thing though I found interesting in in the scriptures though it says that if they get the mark, I mean, it seems like it's irreversible. Um, That's what people think. Christ said, "If your eye offends, pluck it out. Hmm. If your hand offends, cut it off and cast it from you." Right, and then he put that in a specific content context. Right, he said, "It's better that a member of your body should perish, right, than a member should perish." then that your whole body should be cast alive into hell, you know, and that your soul should perish. You know, fear God who can burn both body and soul in hell, right? So the point is, he didn't explicitly say anything about the mark in relation to that. But we know from scripture that does talk about the mark that it'll go in the forehead, in or on, or in or on the right hand. Those would be the primary locations for the mark to be placed per scripture, Okay. So if they put the mark on or in your hand, there is a way to remove it, cut off the hand. If they put it in or on your forehead, there is a way to remove it, carve it out of your head. Now that's not a very pleasant thing to think about, but that's exactly what the Lord is talking about. It wasn't simply a, a spiritual teaching that he was given, uh, a giving, pardon me. Certainly it is that, but it's more than that. And there's no guarantee. I want to be clear about this. Folks, if you apostatize and you go take the mark later on because you think you can get away with it and maybe you know cut it out later just in time before the Lord comes to cast you down to hell, don't count on being saved. You don't get to play games with God. He might just ensure that you die before you get to cut that out. And furthermore, if you do cut it off, there's still no guarantee that he's going to forgive you and allow you to live rather than cast you down to hell. You have an option, though, at that point which is to fall on your knees and cry out to God and call on his mercy, maybe 
he'll have mercy on you and save you. But that is not guaranteed. So I want to be clear about that. It's not 100% that you'll be condemned if you take that mark, if you genuinely repent later and have it excised from the body. But if your intent ahead of time is to do something like that, forget it. Uh, I have to, well, I have to be honest with you, Tim. Mm -hmm. When I've thought about the mark, and I know that you've studied this way more than I have, I've thought about you know, the way that they can control people now. And so I just thought, kind of thought, well, the mark, when the, people get the mark in their hand and forehead, that there's going to be a mechanism, I don't know, through 5G or whatever, that they would be able to control you and that you would not really have free will at that point to even choose God. But I probably am wrong, but that's kind of what I would think, thought. All right. So I get into transhumanism in an upcoming series called the solar apocalypse and i deal with counterfeit aliens and all sorts of other stuff in that series and i'll tell you why i bring that up in a moment i also address transhumanism a bit in a book that i have coming out on the depopulation agenda which is not public i'm not sharing it on prophecy as decided the, through the publisher yet but in that agenda there is a mechanism that's being put in place to be able to remotely kill people through signals like 5g it's already being implemented right now it's been in play for years now I give the technical proof and documentation that I'm not speculating. I give hard evidence in that book on the depopulation agenda. Uh, they've created a mechanism. They're trying to fully implement it. It is already being implemented to achieve something like that, where they can do targeted death through something like a 5G signal. Now, is that the mark of the beast? Uh, no, there's no evidence for that at this point. Is it complete totalitarian control? Yes, that is one of their intents with that in addition to depopulation. So without going into detail here on that, maybe we can do that in a, in a later uh, interview after the second edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea is out and that book on the depopulation agenda is released. Uh, but the agenda is way beyond what you've heard, folks. Uh, and it is from multiple angles at the same time. And literally all of it sits beneath Prince Charles, now King Charles III. And before a large portion of it was sitting beneath uh, Prince Philip, Charles' father. I am not speculating. When I say those things, uh, Philip was heavily tied into eugenics for the purpose of depopulation. Charles has now taken that over. It has been done under the British monarchy for several decades. They're implementing it now already. In other words, it's no longer theoretical. It's being implemented right now. And so I cover all of that, every angle there is to it, the things that people know and the things they don't, including this option for them to do targeted killing uh, by remote signal in that book. Okay. Now, and then the transhumanist agenda, though, is part of this because part of the same mechanism to allow targeted killing, they're going to try to do something to connect humans initially to computers, initially supposedly to help us. Elon Musk is part Elon of this Musk's agenda, by the technology, way. Technology, right? Yeah, and he, by the way, was tied in with the World Economic Forum. A lot of people don't know this about Musk. Charles is over the World Economic Forum. He's over Klaus Schwab, who started and founded the World Economic Forum. The whole Great Reset. As I mentioned in our prior interview, where we gave evidence on Charles being the Antichrist, the whole Great Reset is under Charles. It's his reset. He's the one who first used that phrase, who gave it to Klaus Schwab, who initiated it through the World Economic Forum. It's all under him. And part of that, under, through the World Economic Forum, is this transhumanist agenda where it's not theoretical. They're actually making, they're actually doing things now to begin to move humanity to a point of forced transhumanism. A step at a time. That also is addressed in the depopulation agenda book that I'll have coming. So I won't say more about that now, but it's not the mark of the beast. It's a different agenda also under the Antichrist. It's part of the effort to have global totalitarian control ultimately under the devil, through the Antichrist, through his henchmen, if you want to call them that, etc. Getting back uh, to the issue of the timing of the rapture, folks, the bottom line is it's untrue when anyone tells you that the church won't know who the Antichrist is in advance. In fact, that directly contradicts scripture, and not only because the rapture is not, in fact, going to be pre or mid tribulational or pre wrath. And by the way, I said pre wrath is not true either, because we're going to be here on the earth when the bowls of wrath are being outpoured, but we're going to have our eternal bodies at that point, which is why I pointed out that we're resurrected or translated the instant that seventh trumpet starts to sound. That trumpet begins to sound before the bowls of wrath are outpoured. And that trumpet sounds for a period of days. The moment it starts to sound, we get our eternal incorruptible bodies, whether we've survived and God translates us, 
whether we've died and we're resurrected and standing on our feet on the earth at that point in our eternal bodies, right after we're resurrected or translated, the bowls of wrath begin to be outpoured in sequence. And nobody can deny that the bowls of wrath are God's fury. They're his wrath. But here's the thing that's true. God's wrath won't touch us. It will not harm us. He supernaturally protects us at that point because we have our incorruptible eternal bodies. His wrath can't harm and won't harm those bodies. It's not targeted against us. It's targeted against the unbelieving world, those bowls of wrath. So that's my point. Though we're still on the earth and we're in our resurrected or translated bodies, even by the time we get to the period where the world is in physical darkness under that fifth bowl of wrath, the nations, the unbelievers around us, even though we haven't necessarily, if we're not part of the 144,000 and we're not the two witnesses, even though we're still scattered around the world, standing you know, in our resurrected bodies, when the world is in physical darkness, we will literally be shining out of the middle of that like stars mm-hmm. in our eternal bodies, reflecting the Lord's glory, mm-hmm. not our glory, his. And that's why he says that we would shine like the sun in the kingdom of heaven. He tells us that in the gospels, the Lord did, Yeshua told us that. That's why in Isaiah 60, it says, arise and shine, right? For deep darkness will envelop the peoples. And I'm paraphrasing here. So go read Isaiah 60. But the the peoples will come to the brightness of your rising, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, they'll see the Lord's glory reflected on us, kind of like when Moses came down off Mount Sinai, only more so because we'll be in resurrected or translated bodies. Okay. So the point is, we'll be present on the earth in those supernaturally protected and eternal bodies while the bowls of wrath are being outpoured. They won't harm us. That's how we get protected from God's wrath. The other way we're protected, and I pointed this out in my comments under the uh, initial video that we did our earlier interview, Janie, is that those who are in Judea, those Christians, those believers who are there, whether Jew or Gentile, you know, Israelite or non-Israelite, when we see Jerusalem encircled, encircled by the militaries of the nations, Israel's adversaries, or when we see the idol placed in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, when we see either of those things, we're to flee from Judea, to get out of Judea, we're to flee to the mountains and the wilderness. Christ said that, Messiah said that in the Olivet Discourses. Why are we supposed to flee? According to what he said in Luke, Luke 21, in the Olivet Discourse, in that gospel, he said, quote, for there shall be great wrath upon this people. Well, we know that includes the devil's wrath, because we know Israel is going to be attacked by the nations under the Antichrist and under Satan, right? And half of Jerusalem taken captive in war, according to Zechariah 12 to 14. You know, that's the devil's wrath against Israel in this case, or against believers who are present in the land in Judea at that time. But it's also God's wrath against unbelieving Israel for having been so unrepentant and so hard against them and so unwilling to recognize that Yeshua is the Messiah up to that point, much of Israel. So believers are not to be present in Judea after those events begin to commence, where we see Jerusalem encircled by the militaries of the uh, the, uh, nations, so that half the city is about to be taken captive in war, the old city, or when the idol is erected to the Antichrist in the holy place, or for that matter, when Charles himself stands there at some point. But initially when that idol gets placed there, and I showed the idol, I believe you showed it actually, and I talked about it right. in our prior interview. It already exists. There's already right, a statue, statue, a winged yes. statue to Charles. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the idol that's going to be placed as a desolating abomination on the Temple Mount. So here's the point, and I'll, and I'll finish with this issue on the rapture. It's a big one. I bring it up a lot because it's the primary thing that people object to when they think, uh, Charles, the Antichrist, that can't be, because they've been so deceived by false teachers and by teachers who do not understand Bible prophecy as they should, and who've been unwilling to examine the evidence that's now been out literally for decades. Again, I first spoke about this in 1987 to various Messianic pastors and to just others I would encounter. And then in 1990, 1998, the first edition of my book was published 24 years ago. Okay, right, and we point. interviewed you when I was Sid Roth's producer. We interviewed you back then on that. So we have right. proof. <laughs> so, and a lot of people heard uh, through Sid Roth's once, ministry, right, right about this, right, through Jewish Voice Today, through other ministries, through multiple ministries. But it's just been suppressed since then. It's no longer going to be suppressed, folks. 
things change this year. God's going to allow me now to share this with the whole world. And so this has begun actually with your program, Janie. So, you know, right after uh, this thing happened with Charles that's shown in our prior interview in uh, Birmingham, England, where he oversaw the world being led in worship right, the, of a giant mechanical bull. Right, the Commonwealth other Games. Things. And I won't go into the details on that, people. You have to go see that first interview if you haven't, and then come back to this. Uh, that being said, we'll be here even when God's wrath is outpoured, but we'll be protected. We're protected during the Great Tribulation by obedience, by getting out of Judea. That's how we're protected at that time, by not being present in Judea when there's great wrath upon this people. That's where most of modern Israel's population is, is in Judea. It's not in Samaria or Galilee. You know, there are some so-called settlements in some of those areas. It's mostly concentrated in Judea, most of Israel's Jewish population. That's the area where believers are to not be present, to vacate throughout the Great Tribulation. We're not supposed to be there. The only exceptions to that are the two witnesses. They will be there. And I won't get into them right now, but they are the only exceptions. And then later on, we're protected from God's wrath by virtue of having our eternal bodies when the bowls of wrath are out poured. So that's how it actually works, folks. You'll find a great deal more information, a lot of evidence, a lot of teaching where you can go to scripture and verify what scripture says in my teaching titled The Real Rapture. So now, with that being said, you no longer have an excuse to say, Charles can't be the Antichrist because we're still here, or we can't know who he is because the rapture is pre-tribulational. And let me point out also, Revelation 13, and specifically verse 18, where it says to do the calculation of this beast that has the imagery that we've already talked about, mm -hmm. that scripture wouldn't be present in the Bible if God didn't intend for us to know. So anyone who says to you, we can't know, all you have to do is say, well, here it is. He tells us we can. It's right here right. in Revelation 13. Right. We're allowed to calculate it if we have the imagery. Yes. And even in Daniel 7, where it talks about a little horn of human eyes, the same individual, the same beast that rules for three and a half years, but the same person, you know, first beast, but described with completely, Im completely different imagery, a, a little horn of human eyes. That's the unicorn with human eyes on Charles' heroic achievement, his coat of arms. It's got that too, also on his coat of arms. And he is called unicorn. That's his call sign. That's the code word used for Charles by our secret service in the United States when he visits this country. And Charles calls the unicorn on his coat of arms, my little horn, you know, and, and there's other stuff around all that. But the point is he has all the imagery. He knows he has all the imagery. He knows who he is. People ask that too. They say, do he know? Does Charles know, you know, that he's the antichrist? My answer to that is yes, he does know, and he's known for a very long time. He's known since he was a little child, in fact. But that being said, and, and I've discussed that in the book with evidence. So that being said, um, let's move on now with these other questions, because there are several objections that people raise besides these big ones that we've started with on William and the timing of the rapture, and can right. we know who the Antichrist is in advance? And I will come back to this restrainer. You asked me about the chain and the, the restrainer being loosed in 2 Thessalonians 2. For the revelation of the antichrist right after our next question i'll come back and answer that one okay uh there are people that have said at the economic summit charles said we need trillions of dollars at his disposal and they say well see he's talking about his that must be the antichrist he's talking about <clears throat> so it's not him what would you say he was talking about the antichrist he was also talking about the devil mm. satan just like when he said, my father put the coronet or the crown on my head, but the whole world could see his mother did it. So there are multiple aspects to answer this, and I'll go through them quickly. I do have a whole chapter on what's changed with Charles becoming king of England now, King Charles III. In the second edition of the Antichrist and the Company, there's an entire chapter devoted to just that. And there's quite a few things, but there are some key points. One is he now has the wealth of the crown at his disposal. In other words, it's directly at his disposal. When we read in various articles and magazines, you know, where people are speculating or trying to calculate what the wealth is of the crown, or now under Charles, or now the wealth supposedly of Charles as king. In the past, they would have said of the queen, it was about 11 billion, roughly. Uh, and, and then uh, they ratcheted that up to 20 some billion, and now more recently, 40 to 50 billion in that range. That's what you'll read publicly as the wealth of the crown. That's actually not correct. 
all the nations of the British Commonwealth, specifically the subset of them that recognize the British monarchy as their monarchy, technically in those nations, the monarchy actually owns all of the land. All that land is leased technically to the peoples of those nations. So in other words, all of Canada's land and resources, natural resources, all of Australia's, all of New Zealand's, et cetera, actually belongs to the crown. Oh. And if you look at it from that perspective, and we're talking a sixth of the world's surface, roughly, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what it is off the top of my head. I have a more precise thing in the chapter, but, and there's actually a book someone wrote on this topic. I referenced it in that chapter, wrote a long time ago, who knows nothing at all about Charles being the Antichrist or anything like that, just about the real wealth of the crown. But it's actually in the tens of trillions with a T dollars, the equivalent wealth. Mm -hmm. If that's true, and I'm not saying Charles can access or use all that wealth, you know, that's a technicality. If somebody actually, actually has all that and the world were to actually acknowledge that, if they were to admit to that, those nations, does that even mean that if you want to be, you know, sell off a chunk of those nations, for example, and give them to somebody else or use that wealth, could he actually avail himself of it? Probably not, but I'm not going to argue that point. I'm simply saying technically, he's a multi-trillionaire right now by virtue of the crown, which means if you combine the wealth of every other wealthy person on the planet, all of them combined, all of them, even then, the crown is exponentially, in other words, multiple times, maybe not exponentially, that might be an exaggeration, but several times wealthier than they all are combined. So in other words, he's got a lot of trillions of dollars beneath him through the crown alone. Whether he can use it or not, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'd have a hard time arguing that either way. I think most people would today in this modern world. That being said, the whole carbon taxation scheme, which he's actually speaking to uh, when he said uh, at his disposal, mm -hmm. Charles said they need tens of trillions of dollars. And I quoted actually from earlier COP speeches that he gave and statements that he made publicly in prior years, where he actually referenced something on the, the order of $90 trillion, $90 trillion is what they need. Okay. That was years ago before he made this statement. All that is being orchestrated through various entities internationally. And a primary one at this point is the World Economic Forum, where he made and actually, it was COP27, pardon me, where he made this statement in Scotland, but, uh, or no, COP26, I'm sorry. Last year's COP agreement uh, in Scotland is where he made this statement. And people can pull that up online and listen to his entire speech. I've documented it in that chapter because of this statement. But the point is, all that is being acquired under him through this carbon taxation scheme, the United Nations is part of it under Charles. And I outlined in our prior interview how the United Nations itself, ex itself exists because of the British monarchy by virtue of the Royal in in Institute of International Affairs, which the monarchy is over, and the League of Nations uh, came about because of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in large measure. And then the United Nations came out of the League of Nations. So in reality, the UN exists because of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which Charles heads mm -hmm. and has headed and did head even as Prince of Wales. So that, may, and it's called Chatham House as well. That's another name for it. But all this wealth, this carbon taxation is intended to be under the Antichrist, in this case, under the devil. The his to whom he's referring is the devil. And when as the Antichrist, he receives a mortal wound and recovers from that in a, in a seemingly miraculous way so that the world begins to follow after him, as we read in Revelation 13, Satan will be possessing him at that point. So in other words, the wealth will be under the devil who's in the Antichrist and therefore will also be under the Antichrist himself. In this case, Charles. Okay, so then with when you're talking about climate um, also, then is he over what happened with the Pope and the religious leaders in Mount Sinai in that recent event with the rewrite their 10 commandments regarding the climate. Okay. And I'm going to answer this two different ways. The whole modern climate agenda stems from the Rio earth summit of the early 1990s. So the Rio earth summit led to the Kyoto protocol in Japan, 
onto which most of the nation signed, in addition to having formerly, previously signed onto the Rare Earth Summit in the early 1990s. The Rare Earth Summit led to the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol led to all of the COP meetings that have occurred to this day. So until you get to COP21, those COP meetings weren't considered to be very successful. But with COP21, COP26, those two, and now COP27, the thing you're asking about, these 10 commandments at Mount Sinai, you know, coming out of COP27, all of that stems from the Rio Earth Summit. The Rio Earth Summit was a success because of Charles. He was personally credited by world leadership, including the president of Brazil, including Al Gore, including all the major stakeholders for the success of the Rio Earth Summit because he organized aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia the meetings of the stakeholders beforehand, where they hashed out the main issues beforehand, before the summit actually took place in a formal public way. And because Charles did that and acted as the mediator, the interlocutor, et cetera, he was personally credited later for the success of that summit. The statue that was given to him, that is the idol that will be placed upon the Temple Mount years from now, or maybe as short as a year and a half from now, whenever it is, you know, at the start of the Great Tribulation, whether we're in the Tribulation Week or not yet, I'm not saying whether we are yet, whenever it's placed there, and that will be at the start of the Great Tribulation, that statue was given to Charles. It was commissioned by a president of Central Brazil, the, the president of Tokentons, right, to hail Charles with his face. <laughs> With his face, you know, mm -hmm. overspread, outspread wings, wearing only a loincloth, standing atop a mass of human bodies, looking up to him as a godlike figure, as a savior. And in fact, the statue actually has on the inscription, on its base, inscribed savior of the world. And they're looking up to Charles as the environmental savior of the world. So it ties directly to all this cop stuff, this climate stuff, right? Why do I bring all that up? Charles acted beforehand to ensure the success of the Rio Earth Summit and then was credited by the world for the success of that, right? So now you had uh, COP27, Charles chose not to attend that one. He was involved in most of the prior ones, but he chose not to attend this one. He did something different this time. November 4th, he held a meeting in London where all the key stakeholders, nations and individuals for COP27, came before him Ooh. and he addressed things beforehand, just like he'd done for the Rio Earth Summit previously. <laughs> All so, this stuff, including these, these 10 commandments, which the Pope is also on board with, right? And we'll come to him in a moment. All this stuff is being orchestrated under Charles, including these 10 commandments, these climate 10 commandments for COP27. Wow. November 4th, look it up. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Here we go he had, again. He Behind the meeting. scenes and people didn't know about it really. Most well, people didn't. It, it wasn't highly publicized, but some people knew about it. It was, you know, publicized, mm -hmm. but look this up. Charles held a meeting, 200 plus attendees. I think it was nations and individuals, the major stakeholders in this case for COP 27, because Charles wasn't going to go to that. Now that he's King in person, he's trusting his lower level people, in other words, to handle it, but he's giving them direction beforehand to make sure it goes how he wants. And that's what it was. And now you've got the Pope coming in kind of from the side, almost as a partner, but without saying he's a partner, to promote these, these uh, climate 10 commandments, right? The Pope and the Vatican. So people look that up as well. So now let's, let's continue because we'll say more about that. But yes, Charles is behind it. Okay. All right. Now, another objection people have said, they said, isn't the Antichrist supposed to be a homosexual? And hey, Charles has been married twice, so um, he doesn't fulfill that. Okay. So scripture is, as I said earlier, more complicated in the sense that it gives us more information. I'll, this is a better way for me to say it. Scripture, scripture gives us a lot more information about the last days and the things that are going to happen and who does what when than people who have studied prophecy their whole lives have been able to see. It's there in scripture. People who study prophecy who don't know what I know, and by the way, folks, it's not just for me. I'm given all this in my books. So get in my books. It's all laid out from scripture, thoroughly explained. I'm going to explain a little bit here so that you get the general outline, but there's much more in the books. So 
I have a teaching, by the way. Let me point people to this, Janie. I spoke at a church Sunday before uh, last. It's a little over a week ago. It's posted on my YouTube channel under uh, interviews, under presentations, under the subject of the Antichrist, under the subject of North Korea, Iran, and the coming world war, et cetera. That interview where I talk about multiple Antichrists, plural, under the Antichrist. And then there was a second teaching given the same day, also posted, where I talk about some of the harmony of weeks in my upcoming Messiah History and the Tribulation Period series. Folks, you're going to understand why I'm getting into this very quickly in a moment, but I'm showing that when you properly harmonize the four Gospels for the crucifixion week and know the correct timing of the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua and show that he was actually crucified on a Wednesday, not on a Thursday or a Friday, but on a Wednesday, and he was actually resurrected at the exact end of the uh, weekly Sabbath that week. So not Sunday morning, the next morning, when the women first found that he was already resurrected, already gone from the tomb, et cetera, but he had rose, risen hours before that. In other words, he was crucified on the fourth day of the week, a Wednesday, resurrected at the exact end of the seventh day, the exact end of the weekly Sabbath, only to be seen hours later after that. Here's the point. When you properly harmonize the Gospels for that week and show that, you can put up against that harmony all the other weeks of Scripture, including the Tribulation Week. And what you will discover, and by the way, the Tribulation Week is summarized in the seven seals, beginning in Revelation 6. It's roughly a seal per year. You can put up against the Crucifixion Week, all the other weeks of Scripture, and you discover the pattern is identical. Even the Creation Week, same pattern. So to put that in context, the sun went down over the cross or the, su or the sun was obscured so that you couldn't see the sun as Christ is being crucified, right? Later in the day, between the, uh, the sixth and the ninth hours, mm -hmm. the sun was obscured over the cross and it was taken as a sign the day that he was crucified and the day that he died. Fourth day of the Creation Week, God made the sun, moon, and stars for what? Signs and seasons, signs. Fourth seal of the apocalypse. The writer's name is what? Death. What happens under him? People are killed by the beast of the earth, by death, by famines, by pestilences, etc. What happens to the victim of crucifixion? Their belly distends as if they were starving to death from the trauma, the physical trauma to the body. They look like a victim of starvation. They're pierced as if by beasts of the earth. In this case, the hands, the feet, Christ also on his head. Then a uh, spear plunged into his side later, right? Pierced like the beasts. Uh, they suffer a fever. You know, like somebody, the worst imaginable illness or flu while, they're, while their body is collapsing internally on the cross, okay? As if by pestilence. In other words, I'm pointing out the things that people will suffer under the fourth seal of the apocalypse, roughly the fourth year of the tribulation week, the same year in which the great tribulation starts, mimic what happened to Christ on the cross, okay? So that being said, here's where I'm going with this. Okay, desire of women, it's more complicated. So there are more things that happen in the tribulation week than people realize just with the surface of reading of scripture. Here's my point. If you take the six millennia of history that are already past, we're almost nearing the end of the sixth day, the sixth 1000 year period of history now, we know the sequence of, event, uh, of events throughout that day from scripture and from history. We know who did what, what major kingdoms, for example, did what and when. We have a fairly good idea. Those six millennia are mostly fulfilled at this point, right? The entire crucifixion week already fulfilled. The entire creation week already fulfilled. You can take that information, particularly the week of history that's six days past now, and you discover that the same actors, if you could condense them into a six-year period, this first six years of the tribulation week, are doing the same things in the same sequence in the tribulation week. So when we get into this thing about Daniel 11, and not having desire for women, the person who's being talked about is a king of the north, a king of the Seleucid dynasty. So historically, in the fourth millennium, the fourth day of the week of history, you have the rise of Alexander the Great's empire in the second century BC, the breakup of his empire, and actually it's before that for Alexander, but the breakup of his empire, and then the rise of Four smaller dynasties from the breakup of Alexander's empire, Alexander the Great. The two major ones were the King of the North and the King of the South, or the Seleucid dynasty and the Ptolemaic dynasty, respectively. 
The Seleucid dynasty was centered in modern Syria, northern Syria to southern Iraq. So the region of, of us Syria is primarily where, where the Seleucid dynasty was centered. And there were mo multiple capitals for it historically named Seleucia. The first one was Seleucia on the Tigris River, not very far from where Damascus is today. But, but that was the Seleucid dynasty. The Ptolemaic dynasty, the king of the south, was centered in Egypt. Those are the two major dynasties that came out of the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire. The king of the north also gave rise, in this case, to Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and I'm not pronouncing that right, but uh, he was one of the kings of the north. He is the one who desecrated the temple in the time of the Maccabees in the second century BC. He was one of the kings of the north. He might have been called an Assyrian because of the region from which he arose. Why do I bring all that up? There's a portion of Daniel 11, verses 35 through 39, that has a dual fulfillment. 35 to 39 was fulfilled historically already, okay, including under Antiochus IV, largely fulfilled already. Verses 40 to 45 of Daniel 11 are not yet fulfilled. Those reach forward to the Great Tribulation, things yet to come, to be done by a king of the north. In other words, a future king of the north. Okay, a different when one. When people read Daniel 11, verse 37, I think it is, you can go look it up. And it says, this king of the north does not regard the desire of women. Mm -hmm. People look at that and they think, well, this is an obviously evil character. He's into warfare. It sounds like he's into warfare. He doesn't regard women. Maybe he's homosexual. This guy's the Antichrist. That's what they think, right? Right. Here's the problem. There are many Antichrists historically. There are multiple Antichrists in the world today, historic, uh, even now, today. There are multiple Antichrists. King Jong, King Jong Un of North Korea is an Antichrist. Xi Jinping over China, he's an antichrist. Right, an antichrist, but not the antichrist. Right. There are plenty of antichrists, including in the world today. And there's also the spirit of antichrist, which is defined for us. In fact, the antichrist, multiple antichrists, and the spirit of antichrist, all three are addressed by John in his epistles prior to the book of Revelation. And by the way, the two presentations I mentioned that I gave last Sunday, which are now posted online under my YouTube channel. I go through those scriptures from John in those presentations. So I won't do that now. But the point is, there are multiple antichrists. There's also the spirit of antichrist. And then there's the antichrist, the one who's going to be over a global government for three and a half years throughout the Great Tribulation, who's going to be possessed before that and throughout that period by the devil himself, who is going to be the son of perdition like Judas's carryout was, as we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There are two people in history called the son of perdition. One is Judas's carryout who was possessed by the devil when he went to betray Christ, so that he would be crucified on that fourth day of the week, right? Judas was the Antichrist of the crucifixion week. That's who Judas was. You know, <laughs> we might have thought today in our context today that he was a Christian, right? Because he was a follower of Christ. He was mm -hmm. one of his disciples. But the devil chose somebody who was, quote unquote, a Christian, a fake Christian, right? If you want to call him a Christian back then, mm -hmm. a disciple of Christ, one of his inner circle to possess who was not really a servant of Christ, who didn't really believe. So the devil possessed Judas, who had control of the money, right? Judas had the money. What does Charles want? He wants the money, the trillions. Wow, Give so me all the, the trillions. parallels. Uh -huh. Okay. Judas was possessed. He became the son of perdition. He went to betray Christ so that he could be crucified, right? The Antichrist will be possessed to betray Israel and the church so that Israel as a nation can be crucified. And I won't explain that that typology, I won't explain it here. It is explained in my prophecy conference set. It is explained somewhat in my presentation on Sunday last week that you can pull up online. So going on from this, when we get back to this thing, Daniel 11, the individual we're talking about, the Assyrian or the king of the north, is not the same person as the Antichrist. This is the problem that people are having. They're conflating multiple individuals with the Antichrist. So, for example, people right, will right, because this people person. have said, isn't the Antichrist an Assyrian? So you're answering this also. I am. They'll right. say, isn't he the king of the north? Isn't he, the, uh, mm -hmm. isn't he an Assyrian? Others will say a lot of other things that we'll get to in these objections. Mm -hmm. But that's what they'll say. They'll say, isn't he a homosexual? But Charles was married. Mm -hmm. He's got children, right? It can't be him. That's what they'll say. And then they say that, of course, not knowing a lot about Charles either. But in any case, uh, this king of the north, this person who is an Assyrian, not the only Assyrian, but he's an Assyrian, who is an Antichrist in Daniel eleven thirty-seven, 37, already lived historically. There's a dual fulfillment here. And I talk about that in my Messiah history 
and the tribulation period multi-volume series where I go through the actual history in relation to this passage and everything else in the Bible. But the point is, there's a dual fulfillment there. There's somebody else in the last days like this, another king of the north from Daniel 11:35 all the way through 45. So there's a dual fulfillment from 35 through 39. And people conflate that other person with the Antichrist, when in reality, they're different individuals. And I point that out in my Messiah history in the tribulation period, they're different Antichrists, okay? So this verse is not at all about Charles. That's the first point. The second point is, uh, it isn't actually about homosexuality either. The desire of women is actually a title for the Messiah. It's not about the King of the North being a homosexual, and it never was. <laughs> The Assyrians, the Babylonians, they had familiarity, familiarity with Maseroth or the Zodiac, the corrupted version of it. And in the Zodiac, the Messiah is known as the desire of women. That's one of his titles because he's the promised seed from Genesis 3.15. The women of antiquity knew that there would come a woman, you know, a descendant of Eve, who would bear the seed who would crush the serpent's head, right? the promised seed. They wanted to be the person who would bear that seed. That was considered a blessed thing. And that's why Mary, Miriam, Yeshua's mother, is blessed among women, right? Scripture tells us she would be called blessed because she gave birth to the Messiah. She's the woman who gave birth to that seed. She's the one who fulfilled it historically, right? So she's called blessed. That being said, uh, what it's actually stating about this king of the north is that he does not regard the desire of women. In other words, he does not regard the Messiah. He doesn't regard the desire, uh, the God of Israel in reality. Mm -hmm. Instead, he regards the God of munitions or a God of munitions or fortresses or forces. You can translate the Hebrew all three ways as fortresses, forces, or munitions. In other words, warfare. So there's a saying, he doesn't regard the real God. He could care less about the Messiah. What he cares about is making war and having weapons to deal with his enemies or whatever. Whoever is controlling the region of southern Iraq and northern Syria, when the time comes for that passage to be fulfilled, will be that person. You know, the United States and NATO have been in Iraq for decades now, since the Gulf War, right? We're not in Syria. We're not in Egypt. This king of the north, whoever he is, will overflow the territory of the king of the south, and he'll go through Israel to get there. Okay, and but you're still you're saying that that king of the north is not going to be the antichrist. Correct. Okay, it so doesn't mean just... he won't be under the antichrist, though he will be under the antichrist. Mm -hmm. So consider that Charles is most in control of the UK, even though most people think that he doesn't have a lot of power in the UK. That's not true. The prime minister reports to him. The reason Liz Truss is gone, and she's been replaced. And by the way, I should mention, this ties into our earlier question about his and the finances and the trillions of dollars. Liz Truss is gone because she wasn't playing ball. She's a conservative, right? Within weeks, Charles had her ousted. He orchestrated that. And who took her place? An unelected uh, bureaucrat who's worth tens of, uh, tens of billions of dollars, pardon me, through his wife, whom he married, an Indian Harris to a billionaire's fortune who, who has a controlling interest in and founded Infosys. Infosys is one of the major companies in the world behind the push for digital currency, global central bank currencies. And those would be programmable currencies where, let's, and this is all going to be done under Charles too, part of the taxation scheme. If they don't like what you're spending your money on, or they think you're buying too much gas to fuel your automobile, or they think you're buying too much red meat and cows produce too much methane or, or nitrogen, right? To pollute the, pollute the soil or the atmosphere. They just turn off your funds. Right, right. Oh, You'll be on, yeah, the, the money's in your account. But you, yeah, the money's in your account, but we're not going to let you spend any more this week or this month. Right, which China is already doing, correct? Yeah, no. Yeah, but they actually turn off your funds. So you can't spend the money. Mm -hmm. Like you've got the credit card and the money is there and you've got so much credit, right? Or you've got the debit card and the money's in your account, but my card's not working anymore. It won't have it. I can't buy this thing. Okay. Well, they can go further than that. They can implement taxes at that point for anything. You ate too much red meat. Oh, dang, that cost you a buck. Right. You uh, bought too much gas. Hmm, we think we should raise the cost of your insurance, but since we can't do that, maybe we can't do that. 
we'll take a hundred bucks to fund our anti uh, carbon, you know, scheme. Thank you very much. We'll we'll take a hundred bucks. So that being said, this fellow who's now prime minister in the UK, the very first week he was prime minister, he spoke to the G7 about implementing these programmable currencies, these cashless currencies. And then he spoke to the UK about the same thing. He was pushing it immediately upon being prime minister. And he's, he's a very wealthy person, tens of billions of dollars, right? Why would he even care? So, so that's my point. That's another part of the his. And so Charles claims descent from ancient Babylonia, from ancient Assyria, specifically their kings and rulers, from Rome's ancient emperors, from Egypt's ancient pharaohs, from Israel's King David, you know, officially that claim is made through the British monarchy's official lineage, in this case, Queen Elizabeth II's, Charles' deceased mother's official lineage, claims that they are descended from King David and explicitly they claim to sit upon the throne of David. So Charles, as far as he's concerned right now today, is actually sitting upon the throne of David. Right. As far we- as he's concerned, he's Israel's king right now. Mm-hmm. Even if Israel isn't yet acknowledging that, people need to understand that. So, so this is, I shared in our prior interview that it's been announced in Israel that Charles, when he was prince, it was announced more than once on national television that he is a descendant of King David. True or not, and I would argue it's untrue, but true or not, it was taken seriously enough by Israel's rabbinic, some people, some rabbis, somebody in Israel religiously to allow an announcement like that to be made, not just once, but more than once in Israel for Charles, not any other human being to my knowledge, just him. And even before the first edition of the Antichrist and Captivity was published in 1998. In other words, when the world was viewing Charles as the most eligible bachelor, even back then, they were looking at him as possibly the Messiah or possibly his line as being the lineage of King David since Israel's genealogical records have been destroyed. I documented that. I mentioned that in the first edition of the Antichrist and Kepti in 1998. It's in that book. So, so the point is, now he's actually on a throne where formally, not informally, but formally, that monarchy claims to sit upon the throne of David. Right. So when people say, isn't the Antichrist supposed to be Jewish? He claims that. He claims that. But he actually is a descendant of the tribe of Dan. Right. So the early church understood that the Antichrist, they called him the black one. It's, he's called the black one in the pseudepigraphic writings, which are kind of like apocryphal writings. Um, but there are pseudepigraphical and apocryphal writings where the Antichrist is referred to as the black one. You know, it's another way of saying prince of darkness, but just calling him the black one. At any rate, Charles is the black prince. Heraldically, and I point this out from the symbols on his coat of arms, he is... He has been, since he was invested Prince of Wales in July of 1969, been known as the Black Prince because he wears the badge of the Black Prince, who is the founding Prince of Wales of the Order of the Garter, the oldest and most prominent and most powerful order of chivalry knighthood in the world, founded in the 14th century. Okay, he wears the badge where? He wears it on uh, one of his fingers, on one of his hands. Hmm. He wears it. It's a gold signet ring that has the badge of the Black Prince on it, but that same badge, it's three ostrich feathers uh, encircled by a coronet, which is supposed to be his crown uh, as Prince of Wales, but encircled by a coronet known as the Black Prince. It's the Black Prince's badge. He wears it on a signet ring, but it's also in one of the compartments on his coat of arms. It's also a druidic awen. The three ostrich feathers are arranged to represent a Druidic Awan. So I talk about that. The Awan symbol is a precursor to the mark of the beast. Historically, the, the design of the picket-shaped UPC and EAN barcodes is related to something called the Ogham alphabet of Druidry and also to the Awan of Druidry and Neo-Druidry, both classical and Neo-Druidry. And I address this in my book on the mark of the beast, but all that ties in under Charles uh, and the central symbol of this, this, this neo druidry is, and they're the Gorsed Druids. That's what they're called. Is the red dragon the same red dragon that's on Charles' coat of arms? The same one that represents Satan. The same one that Wales has adopted as their national symbol. It is the 
central symbol of corset druidry. And so they have the Awan and so forth, all tied into the mark of the beast. Um, but at any rate, Charles that's connected the to the, the tribe of Prince. that's connected to the tribe of Dan. It is because the Israel's ancient sages said that the black one would come from the tribe of Dan, mm -hmm. but they based that on a prophecy in Genesis. There's a prophecy in Genesis where, and I believe I described this in our prior interview, but right. people can go look it up. It's from Jacob to his son, Dan. And then of course the tribe of Dan, Dan's descendants. But in that prophecy, there's Yeshua referenced, the Lord's salvation. There is the dragon represented, the serpent, the same serpent that's described in Genesis 3 and identified as Satan and the fiery red dragon in Revelation chapter 12. That same serpent in Genesis 3, the same Hebrew word is used in that prophecy related to Dan. So Dan and that serpent or the fiery red dragon are both in that verse. And Dan... Uh, you know, Dan is a horse who rears up so that its rider goes backward and the dragon bites at the horse's heels, the fiery red dragon, Satan. And Jacob exclaims, I've waited for your Yeshua Lord. So in other words, from that verse, the way that they interpreted it, they understood that the black one or the prince of darkness would come from the tribe of Dan and also a lot of early Christians believed the same thing based on the same prophecy in Genesis, and then based on this teaching in the Siddhagrapha and so forth, the Siddhagraphic teaching. I reference all that stuff in my book. It's just a traditional thing, but Charles meets that uh, criteria, if you wanted to call it a criteria. He is, in fact, a descendant of the tribe of Dan. Okay, Tim, people have other objections about who the Antichrist really should be, and I'd like you to uh, answer the other objections that you read. Another common objection is that the Antichrist is a Muslim from the Middle East. Uh, they don't think Charles is a Muslim, right? He presents himself publicly as a quote unquote Christian. Most of the British press doesn't deny that, even though he's said publicly that he wants to be defender of faith rather than the faith prior to him having become, become king. So I'll come back to that. But they don't realize that Charles has converted behind the scenes to be a Muslim under one of the world's most prominent Sunni Muslims, and that he has an honorary doctorate in Islamic studies from the University in Cairo, Egypt, which is the most prominent seat of Islamic learning among Sunnis in the world. And at the same time, he still claims to be a quote unquote Christian. Is he from the Middle East? No, he's not. Joel Richardson wrote a book where he popularized the idea that the 10 kings, the 10 rulers who'll be under the Antichrist would come out of the Middle East and suggested, implied that uh, Turkey's president because of his conduct, his behavior, his, the things that he had already done, wanted to be the Muslim Mahdi, therefore might be the Antichrist, this kind of thing. Um, Joel Richardson is mistaken. I gave him a copy of the first edition of the Antichrist in a cup of tea. I handed it to him in person when he came to speak at a Messianic congregation, Row Israel, years ago. I don't believe he ever wrote it, uh, ever read it, pardon me, because he continued to promote his book and his view, and I've never had communication with him since. I don't think he bothered to read it. But the bottom line is, uh, there's no one, including any Muslim in the Middle East, no human being on the planet other than Charles, who has the biblical evidence, meets the biblical criteria, all of them, to be the Antichrist. In the case of uh, Erdogan, Turkey's uh, leader, he has zero of the criteria. None right, he doesn't have the biblically. imagery. He doesn't have... He doesn't have the lineage either. Mm -hmm. You know, even if he could claim descent from Muhammad, that's not a biblical criteria or criterion. He, he doesn't meet any of the bi biblical criterion. And I'm not aware of him actually claiming to be a descendant of Muhammad or any credible claim in relation to him for that. But even if he were to make that claim and try to present himself to the Muslims as their Mahdi, that doesn't change anything about the fact that Charles is the biblical antichrist of scripture and prophecy. I do address the 10 kings and how they'll actually arise through the United Nations, in my view. In the first edition of the Antichrist and the nothing has changed about that in relation to the second edition. I suggest that there'll be an expansion of the UN Security Council to 10 permanent members, five from the East, five from the West, as we think of the East-West division in the world today. 
I explain in the book why that is biblical in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. And three of the 10 coming under the direct authority of the little horn with the eyes of a man in Daniel 7, coming under the direct authority of the Antichrist for the three and a half year period of his global rule. Those three, I believe, will be Germany, France, and England. So I expect to see the UN Security Council expanded to 10 permanent members, five from the East, five from the West, as we think of the East-West division in the world. Three of the 10 being from the European Union, coming directly under Charles' authority, but also the British monarchy is actually the German, the French, the Greek, the English monarchy today. It's the monarchy of multiple nations in recent genealogical history. And were Germany and France to try to have a monarchy of their own again formally, or the European Union to say that we want to have a monarchy over the EU, anything like that, all of a sudden Charles is in direct control of Germany, France, and England. But regardless, he is the monarch over those three nations, whether they acknowledge it or not, genealogically and historically. And then on top of that, prior to Brexit, the diplomatic missions of Germany, France, and England were unified as a single mission. So even that alone puts the three directly under Charles, and to a great extent, they're still unified, even with Brexit. Brexit itself could possibly be undone still. We don't know if that'll happen, but whether it is or not, it's still the scenario that to me makes the most sense biblically for the rise of the 10 kings and for three of the 10 to be under the Antichrist and for five to be from the East, five from the West, as we think of the East-West division of the world. So on all counts, I'll say Joel Richardson got it wrong. And Charles, in fact, does claim descent from Muhammad. He is the most popular Westerner in the world to the Muslims in the Middle East. He is a Muslim as far as they're concerned because he converted to Islam. He not just a quote unquote Christian, he's all those things he would tell you if you were honest. And he has an honorary doctorate in Islamic studies, which he obviously wouldn't have if the Muslims in the Middle East didn't take him very seriously. Mm. Right. So. There's all that going for him on that point. Let's move on. Um, um, so, okay, people have said that the Antichrist was Nero. Yeah, so we have preterists, right? There are different approaches to interpreting the book of Revelation. You have the preterist camp, the historicist camp, the symbolic or idealist camp, and then you have the futurist or more literal, we'll say, right. camp. Right, no, I know the, the preterists just say it all, it all happened thousands of years ago. It all came to pass thousands of years ago. Yeah, and there are variants between those. So you might right. have preterist historicist where they merge some of those views, right? So generally the preterists or the preterist historicists often will say that Nero was the Antichrist because of all the wicked things he did to believers, you know, in the arena and so forth, um, the Colosseums in the first century. Because, of course, as a Roman emperor, he claimed to be a god or god Jupiter or Zeus, in this case, Jupiter, incarnate god on earth kind of thing, the way that some of the Romans viewed their emperor. And, of course, the emperors didn't discourage that. They encouraged it, most of them. The Roman emperors did. So you've got this person who was very clearly an antichrist, you know, a big one, because he was out there murdering Christians, doing the kinds of leading of the sheep to the slaughter. You know, that the Antichrist will do. And so the preterists look at Nero and they say, well, you know, we can't take all this stuff in Revelation completely literally. You know, they look, for example, at the imagery in Revelation 13, beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion. Yeah, right. There's no such thing. It's just symbolic of evil. Right, right. Everything you is know, allegorical to them. It's all, Well, a lot of it's allegorical. That gets into the symbolic part where they, they take in a little symbolism or they view it as metaphorical. Mm -hmm. rather than literal, okay? So the, the, the preterists will kind of try to shoehorn everything into the first century AD, you know, with the early church. And Nero will often be their primary guy as the Antichrist. The historists Swiss will say, well, there are other people in history who have been Antichrist. Often they'll point to Roman Catholicism and they'll point to the spirit of Antichrist and they'll call the Pope's successors, if you will, to the Roman emperors the antichrist of the day or antichrist or just speak of the spirit of antichrist or the roman catholic church that's what the historicists will often do you'll get the preterist historicists will kind of compromise on that some will take the 1260 days of a prophecy uh, of revelation the 1260 days the 42 months and so forth 
And they'll allegorize that to 1260 years. And they'll try to shoehorn that into the fifth day and early sixth day of the week of history as the as Roman Catholicism representing the Antichrist. There's a whole bunch of variants on it, actually. And there's not even really agreement between preterists and historicists, but these are the directions they tend to go. And often they'll mention Nero. So in the comments, I've seen multiple times people saying Nero, just Nero, and that's it. Nero, like that's supposed to be an obvious answer or something to people, mm -hmm. right? To others. Mm -hmm. And what they're really saying is, I'm a preterist. I think Nero is the Antichrist. Here's the thing. And one of the reasons I did the Messiah history in the tribulation period series and why I mentioned that harmony of weeks in scripture. The fourth seal of the apocalypse, which summarizes the fourth year and in which under which the great tribulation starts, is in parallel, not just to the fourth day of the creation week. I pointed that out, right? With the sun, moon, and stars being created for signs and seasons. And of course, the sun darkened over Christ's cross and he was crucified. It's also in parallel to the fourth millennium, fourth day of the week of history, right? The fifth seal of the apocalypse is in parallel to the fifth day of the week of history. What do we see under the fifth seal? We see the souls of those who've been martyred, killed for Christ under the altar of God, crying out to the Lord, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you wait? You know, to, and I'm paraphrasing, to avenge our blood on those on the earth. You know, basically those who killed us, who persecuted us, et cetera, right? And the Lord responds that they need to be patient, basically, to wait a while longer until the total number of their brethren and their fellow servants should be killed as they were. That's the fifth seal of the apocalypse, right? These people who are under God's altar, who have died as believers, in many cases persecuted or outright martyred, been led as sheep to the slaughter. And here's my point. Christ was the sheep led to the slaughter on the fourth day of the crucifixion week. And the fifth day, he was under God's altar in paradise, if you will, awaiting his resurrection, right? Awaiting rising from the grave as a lamb who had been slaughtered, the lamb who had been slaughtered, right? In the apocalypse, the church, as well as believing and unbelieving Israel, believing Israel, part of the church, and then of course, unbelieving Israel, both groups led as lambs to the slaughter in the fourth year of the tribulation week. When the great tribulation starts and right before that, the fourth year, we get led as lambs to slaughter, mass martyrdom of Christians around the world, the Antichrist getting ready and beginning the process of killing two thirds of Israel and Judea, which is why believers aren't supposed to be there. Zechariah 12 to 14, we learn that two thirds of Israel in the land in Judea specifically is going to die between the start of those events and the end of the great tribulation by the time Christ returns to defend Israel and survivors and judge and save Israel and the world. <laughs> So the point is, there's being led to the lambs, led as lambs to slaughter. Well, who does that? In the tribulation week, it's under the Antichrist, as well as the Antichrists who are under him. There are other Antichrists in the world today, but he's the Antichrist who will be over the global government. So these other Antichrists will operate under him and under the devil. So it's the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And under them, the other Antichrists of the world doing their thing, including the other horsemen of the apocalypse. And let me just mention briefly... In the teachings I gave last Sunday, not, not a couple of days ago, the Sunday prior, which are available on my YouTube channel, under those various playlists, you'll find them. I went through a teaching that is basically titled, Is Charles the Antichrist over other Antichrists? And in that presentation, I talked about the other three horsemen of the apocalypse, the first three seals of the apocalypse before you get to the fourth horseman and who they actually are, I gave evidence to actually identify them. So I've mentioned before, including in some of my comments under our prior interview, that I know who the other horsemen are. I don't only know who the fourth horseman is and who the Antichrist is, that's Charles, he's the fourth horseman, and the unicorn on his heraldic achievement, the pale green, it's actually not white, it's not just gray or ashen, it's pale green gray, the actual coloration of the unicorn on his heraldic achievement. I actually show that in those presentations that Sunday, the ones I'm mentioning, people will be able to go online and see the actual coloration of his unicorn. Unfortunately, you cannot see that on the printed cover of the Antichrist and Capiti, the physically printed book, because the CMYK colors 
have a lower, a reduced color spectrum, and they actually eliminate that gray hue that's part of the unicorn on this coat of arms, but it's very obvious in full color. So the unicorn, the fourth horse, if you will, of the apocalypse is pale green gray or the color of rotting human flesh. And it's often described as, as just gray or ashen, but it's pale green gray. That is the exact coloration of the unicorn on Charles' coat of arms. He is the fourth horseman. He is the Antichrist under whom the saints in Israel will be led as lambs to slaughter. And by the time we get to the fifth seal under the altar of God, as Christ was on that fifth day in the crucifixion week, as the church was in the fifth millennium of history under Nero and the other Antichrist who followed him. So in the fifth day of the week of history, and Christ came early in the fifth day and was crucified early in the fifth day, the fifth millennium of the week of history in the first century AD, right? As we, as the church, the real church, real Christians were being led at that point as lambs of slaughter under him. And then Israel later, when the whole nation was sacked, right? Under Titus and the Romans and the Temple Mount was destroyed and much of almost everything thrown down except part of that outer wall, you know, the Wailing Wall, and the land salted. And then the survivors of Israel, those who managed to survive that, you know, dispersed into the nations, right? As refugees. All that happened to Israel early in the first century. Well, in the first century, early in the, early in the first, I'm trying to say early in the fifth day, pardon me if I get my language right, early in the fifth day, the fifth millennia millennium, pardon me, of the week of history. So we have a pattern, in other words, that's maintained between and parallels. Weeks. Parallels, yes. But, mm -hmm. but this is my point. And this is what I want the preterists and the historicists who are listening to think Nero's the Antichrist. This is what you need to understand. The apocalypse is literally future, the way that it's written. The events under it are literally future, but there are events in it, like what happens under the fourth seal, that parallel strongly things that have already happened in history, including what happened under Nero. And that is the point I'm making. So they look at Nero and they have this myopic perspective. Nero had to be the Antichrist. He did the stuff that the Antichrist is going to do. He martyred Christians. He led believers and mass to, as lambs to slaughter, right? Nero has to be the Antichrist. He did this stuff. He fulfilled it. That is a non-literal view of scripture. That is an incorrect view of the apocalypse. But typologically, it's correct. The reason it's correct is because Nero was an antichrist early in the fifth day of the week of history in parallel to the antichrist. And Nero was doing the same kinds of things. But it wasn't only Nero. There have been hundreds, if not thousands of antichrists since Nero. Right, just who've not martyred, the antichrist. Right. right, who've martyred Christians under the devil including in our day, right? In Muslim countries and elsewhere around the world. Right. In India, for example, under Hindus. Right. Who are well, martyring well, Christian pastors. Well, now let me just say this, okay, because I want to go mm -hmm. to another objection. Some people say Trump mm -hmm. is, is the Antichrist. People look at Trump. They look at Obama. Neither of them has any of the qualifications. They don't have even what William and Harry have. They're even less qualified than William you know, to be the Antichrist. But here's an important point, and people who think Obama is the Antichrist, pay close attention to this. He is an Antichrist, and you're not wrong about some of the stuff you've been looking at. And I've got a whole book's worth of material I've written on the uh, first and third horsemen of the apocalypse. I did write a book on the second horseman. That's already been published. It was published in 2018. That's called North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War. Behold a red horse. You will find the identity of the red horse, identities actually, but identity of the red horse and its rider in that book. That's on the second seal. Obama actually ties to the first seal. So we talked about, Janie, people conflating the king of the north or the Assyrian with the Antichrist, right? Right. They're actually about different individuals. People are looking at prophecy in scripture and they're tying it to Obama. And they're thinking that because they think they can tie it to Obama, and they're not doing it correctly in most cases. In some cases they are, and I'm going to come to that. They're tying it to Obama and they're saying, Obama has to be the Antichrist, right? So there are some major Antichrists under the Antichrist. 
And those other major antichrists are the first three horsemen of the apocalypse. And they ride in sequence. By the time you get to the fourth horseman, Charles, when he starts to ride, in other words, to actually fulfill the stuff under that fourth seal, all four horsemen are riding together. I'm telling you, Obama may be one of them, and I'm going to explain why that is in a moment. And I'm going to tell you, folks, the first horseman is not the Antichrist. He's not the one who rules the world for three and a half years. He also is not the one who is over a treaty you know, that's made with many and imposed or enforced, that treaty of Daniel 9.27. People think that that treaty, because it's imposed or enforced over that full seven years of the tribulation week, and it does cover the whole seven years, not just the Great Tribulation. So I've said Charles gains control over that global government. It's, it's constituted, and then he controls it throughout the period of the Great Tribulation, the latter half of that seven years. What about the first three and a half years? What's he doing during that period, right? So yeah, good question. he is involved in that period. He is over the other Antichrist in that period, as I show in my book, including through entities like the World Economic Forum including through entities like the United Nations, actually, et cetera. Even though the global government's not constituted yet for that first three and a half years, it doesn't exist yet. But Charles is involved. This entire time, since the 1980s, Charles has been over the entire Middle East peace process, the false peace process from start to finish to this day. Even the quartet is under Charles. Right. And we did talk about that in the other interview. We did. So here's the point. Obama is not. And he's not involved, actually, with any of that. Charles is over those things. Charles will be the one who is involved in imposing that, enforcing it over the nations, not just Israel. The treaty is not made with Israel. This is another mistake that people make. It affects Israel, as I talked about in our prior interview. But it's made with many, la rabin. And I get into that word rabin, which is translated as many in more detail. And I share something nobody's ever heard before to my knowledge, in Christianity from the Hebrew text of Daniel 9.27. But people, if they were looking really closely at the Hebrew text, that verse would see some things. I shared one thing with you in our prior interview about how the statue, the idol to Charles, is actually described in the root words of that text of Daniel 9.27, right? I talked about that. The evidence, the documentation for that, the Hebrew root words, et cetera, all addressed in the second edition of the Antichrist and Cup of Tea. There's something else in that verse I did not talk about, but I did share it in this presentation uh, on the Sunday I'm mentioning that's available on my YouTube channel, and that's this. The word translated Rabim, which is translated as many, and also ties to Yitzhak Rabim, which I, doc I documented in the first edition of the Antichrist and Cup of Tea. I did not mention that in, the, in our interview. I did document it even in the first edition of the Antichrist and Cup of Tea, meaning Yitzhak Rabin was associated with this treaty that's to come to pass in relation to Israel, per that verse, even though the treaty itself isn't really about Israel, it's about enforcing and imposing something on many, meaning all the nations of the world, essentially. Many entities, if you will, are parties in the world, which would be nations and world leaders. But the word translated many isn't only about uh, Yitzhak Rabin or about the literal word many. It has as its root word rob or rob. And that word can be translated arrow. And as rabin, it can be translated arrows, plural. So here's the thing I pointed out this recent Sunday. The rider of the white horse has a bow. We're told he's carrying a bow under the description of the first seal in Revelation 6, verses 1 to 2. He's given a crown. And the particular type of crown in Greek is a Stephanus. It's a victor's crown. It's the same sort of crown that you'd see put on the head of a victor in a Roman or Greek game. Historically, it's like a wreath of leaves. It's that kind of a crown. It's also uh, a crown like the crown of thorns that was put on Christ's head. That's another thing that ties into historicism and preterism I won't go into in this interview, but it is talked about in the Messiah History and the Tribulation Period multi-volume series when that's published. The idea that some people believe Daniel 9.27 is actually about Christ and his crucifixion. Okay, I only mention it here because I'm talking about the fact that that Stephanus, under the first seal, also can be a crown of thorns. All right? You'll understand why I'm going there in a moment. But So there's a Stephanus, either a Greek type of wreath or crown of thorns, or the kind of crown that they would symbolically give with a Nobel Peace Prize. Also that kind of a crown. 
Oh, oh, oh. All right. So then there's so the who, bow. who was given that noble peace yeah, prize. I'm coming to that. Yeah. I'm coming to that. <laughs> then there's then there's the bow that this rider has, right? But he doesn't have arrows. Think about that. He's we're told he's got a bow. People assume he's got arrows, but the verse doesn't say that. He's got a bow. The person who's involved with imposing or enforcing that treaty at the same time. In other words, when that rider goes forth and begins to do his thing under the first seal, the tribulation week begins. At that point, we may know who he is in advance. And in fact, we do know who all of them are in advance. As I've known who the foretold Antichrist is since 1987, decades before he's going to ride as the fourth horseman. He's not riding as the fourth horseman yet. That's still to come, okay? Decades before he receives the mortal wound and recovers in a, in a seemingly supernatural or bizarre way that the world starts to follow after and worship him. Decades before he's possessed by the devil and in control of a global government, right? I've known who he is the whole time. And I've been telling people the whole time. The same thing is true of the other horsemen. I well, know wait a minute. You said, he, that you said he had a mortal uh, wound decades ago. He will. No, will. No. I knew who he was decades before. Right. He's received that Before wound. that he happens. Hasn't it hasn't happened yet. Right. In other words, the Antichrist has been identified and the wound hasn't happened yet. It's coming. I'm saying ahead of time, it's going to be him who receives it or one of the heads, plural, on his heraldic achievement. Actually, if we're going to be very technically literal, scripture says it's one of the heads, plural, of that first beast that receives the mortal wound. You wouldn't necessarily know from that language alone that this is Charles. People assume it's the Antichrist. They assume it's him if they know that he's the Antichrist. But the technical piece of this is that the heads of those beasts on his coat of arms, the beasts of feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, the unicorn with human eyes, the red dragon on his coat of arms, the overall helm at the center of the coat of arms that represents the corporate head of that corporate beast. It's viewed as a corporate beast in heraldry. Beneath it is a label with three horns that seem to descend down beneath. That same label called the label of the eldest son is around the neck of the first beast. It's around the neck of the unicorn. It's around the neck of the red dragon. And it's around the neck of the overall corporate beast, the coat of arms beneath that helm. In other words, that corporate beast represents Charles specifically, but each individual beast, the red dragon, the unicorn with human eyes, the beast of feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, each of those explicitly in heraldry represents him. They each have a head. So there are multiple heads on this coat of arms. That's the reason for the strange language in Revelation 13, where it says one of the heads, plural, will receive this mortal wound. So my point is, Charles hasn't received that wound yet. The first beast has not received that wound yet. It's coming. But nonetheless, for decades, we've been able to prove with hard evidence who the Antichrist is. Now he's ready to take control of a global government that's coming very, very quickly, very soon. So the Antichrist, the foretold Antichrist has the arrows, the rider of the white horse, he's got a bow. A bow, which leads us to think, you know, he's got military weaponry at his disposal to include arrows. He receives a victor's crown. Scripture says he goes forth victorious and to be victorious or conquering and to conquer. The literal meaning of the Greek text there is victorious and to be victorious. And it actually relates to the goddess of victory in relation to the Roman games. Why is that important? So I'm going to tell you exactly why in a moment. But there's one more component I have to bring out, two more actually, in relation to that verse. There's the white horse, right? And then the seal, it's opened and it's introduced with the voice or the sound of thunder. That word thunder, right? So people have looked at Obama and the word Barak, his name, his first name. And they've said that in Hebrew, and some have said in Arabic, but in Hebrew, that the name Barak means lightning. Okay? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, Rahm Emanuel was present at, in 2008 at the Democratic National Convention, the 2008 DNC with Obama, with Biden, in Invesco Field in the center of Denver. I was literally working only blocks from there while it occurred. And I physically felt I experienced a change in the Holy Spirit as that event was transpiring. I wasn't paying any attention to the event prior to that. I knew something had happened. You know, something had changed in the spirit with that event. I didn't know what, you know, I knew that the DNC was happening and Obama and Biden were there. That was really all I knew and that Obama was a non-Christian, et cetera. Over that field is a large Arabian or Mustang, Arabian horse or Mustang, a white horse. That white horse statue overlooks the entire interior of the stadium. 
that horse's name is Thunder. The mascot of the Denver Broncos is an Arabian horse or a Mustang, a white one. Its name is Thunder. And then they've gone through various sequences as horses have died. So Thunder, Thunder 2, et cetera. But Thunder is the name of that Broncos mascot. The mascot was present at the 2008 DNC at this event for Obama and Biden and Rahm Emanuel. I'll talk about Emanuel in a moment, Rahm Emanuel. The horse overlooking the scoreboard, the statue, not the physical living horse, but the statue is named Thunder. The living horse is named Thunder, both present at the event with Obama, whose name means lightning. Rahm Emanuel, his name Rahm in Hebrew means thunder. So you have lightning and thunder present at that event in addition to the white horse, right? Obama is there, Biden is there, Rahm Emanuel is there. Thunder and lightning. Okay, Hitler, pre-World War, pre-World War II Germany had the throne of the devil put in a museum in Berlin. A lot of people don't know this. It's called the Pergamon, the throne from Pergamon in Turkey. And I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly as well. But you see in Revelation where it talks about Satan's throne being in, being in a specific place, right? That place historically was in Turkey in Pergamus. And we read that in the book of Revelation, literally stated. Pre-World War I Germany actually took that throne, the same one, from Pergamos in Turkey, they put it in a museum in Berlin, and they reconstructed the buildings that would have been around it historically at Pergamos, around that throne, and it's in a museum in Berlin, Germany. It was there before World War I, Satan's throne. Where was World War I fomented from? Germany. Where was World War II fomented from? Germany. What did Obama do in connection with traveling the world to speak? for his campaign in 2008, besides the horse and so forth being there at the DNC, he spoke in Germany beneath a statue called Victoria, the goddess of victory, holding in one hand a wreath, a victor's wreath. The exact same one I'm talking about for, for victors of a game. The statue is after the goddess Victoria in pagan mythology, named Victory or Victoria. And guess what? That statue is very close to the Berlin Museum where Satan's throne is. Obama, after that, was hailed as bringing peace to the world, even though he'd done nothing. And the Nobel Peace Committee gave him the Nobel Peace Prize, even though he'd done nothing to bring peace to the world or anything else. He was just tickling the ears of the Europeans and the West, telling them things they wanted to hear, these so-called liberal, quote-unquote liberal Europeans, right? And the voters in the United States who voted for him, tickling their ears. He'd done nothing, but somehow he's a victor. He hadn't even won the election yet, and somehow he's a victor, and they want to give him the Nobel Peace Prize, and he's standing beneath that statue, which is holding the wreath in her hand, and later he is given the Nobel Peace Prize, and you know it is associated historically with the symbol of that wreath, and then he does win the election, right? So he has victory in the election. Well, there's more to it. So the, the Pergamon throne and its buildings there in Berlin, what did the Democratic National Convention do? They built a mock-up of it right in the center of Invesco Field. And that is what was used for Obama's 2008 DNC with Biden. Not only that, Hitler built a mock-up of it too. Hmm. And I showed Hitler's version. That's where Hitler and all the main Nazi rallies actually occurred throughout World War II. Hitler built a mock-up of that whole, of the buildings and the throne. And that's where the main Nazi rallies were held and where Hitler would constantly speak throughout World War II. Hitler had done it, and now you've got Obama and Biden doing it too. In the DNC, beneath the white horse, whose name is Thunder, with the mascot present as Thunder, they're victorious. They win the election. Obama has a bow, the U.S. arsenal, right? Even though Charles is the Antichrist, somehow has the arrows. He'll be in control of those later uh, in some fashion. And, and actually, he's in control of our government behind the scenes anyway. And I can get into that another time or maybe later, but through the World Economic Forum and other entities, he has penetrated our government as he has penetrated Canada's and Australia's and New Zealand's and many others around the world, China's, Russia's, all penetrated by the World Economic Forum. So even Obama is doing all this stuff under the British monarchy, under Charles, and I wanna make that clear, and I did in my presentation Sunday before last. He's a junior antichrist under the person who is to be the 
antichrist over a global government. So that being said, Obama's got the sound of thunder. He had the bow. I'm going to talk about how he still has it. He did have it between 2008 and 2016 when he was president in office. He gained the victory, right? He received the crown, the Stephanus. He portrayed himself under the imagery of the goddess of victory right outside the museum with the Pergamum throne, photographed that way, holding the wreath in her hand. And then there is something more. And that more is this. Um, Obama in his third, he can't have a third term legally, right? After his second term, had to leave office. Obama is on record publicly in video, recorded in an interview, which people can pull up on the internet, stating that he wishes he could have a third term. And if he could have a third term, he would do it vicariously even through the person who was elected president or became president. He would run the show, Obama would, behind the scenes as the actual president and have a third term vicariously. Well, it's exactly what we have with Biden. People look at Biden and all of his gaffes and the fact that he doesn't seem to be all there often enough. Right. Someone's pulling his say, strings. How could, yeah. How could right. this Someone's guy... pulling his strings. But wait, let me just get back to this with yep. Obama. So you're saying that he's the, for, uh, the first horseman. I'm saying the evidence says that. Right. And, I and where is that scripture I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say 100% on it like I would with Charles because right. it's not that level of evidence. It's not at the point where you can say it's mathematically impossible or there are a dozen other things that he fulfills that no one else has ever fulfilled that are very unique that you can say with Charles, okay? It's not on that level. That's a whole different category. So having said that, let's move on to the other objections regarding Charles. But I want to acknowledge those people who say that Obama is the Antichrist. He isn't the Antichrist who will be over a global government. That is provably Charles scripturally. There can be a very good case made, however, that Obama is an Antichrist and could in fact be the rider of the first horse of the apocalypse as the first horseman I myself have been making that case since 2010 publicly. I haven't published it. I have made it. It's recorded. Someday I'll share the recording. I will be publishing it probably about the same time that I start to share the recordings, the earlier ones on that from back in 2010. Okay, Tim, when we were reading the comments from your other interview, there were other objections that people said. One of them, they said, isn't the Antichrist supposed to be 33 years old? Yeah, they'll typically say between 30 and 33 in that range, 34 maybe. And uh, no, there's nothing in scripture that says that. This is another errant teaching that people have acquired, kind of like the idea that he would be a homosexual, as we discussed earlier. Uh, they uh, hear a teaching from a pastor or a Bible person they respect, and they assume that person knows enough to give correct information scripturally. And one of the things that gets parroted is you know, that because Christ was in his 30s when he began his ministry, that's what they say, that and the Antichrist is the counterfeit of Christ, you know, a fake Christ, a fake Messiah, that therefore he must also be in that age range when he, you know, is over a global government or starts to do his thing. So there are multiple problems uh, with those claims or with that teaching. One is that we don't know that Christ was in his 30s when he began his ministry. In fact, there's a passage in the Gospel of John, John chapter 8, that suggests he could have been uh, actually in his late 40s. They said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? You remember that? And uh, right. Wow. They didn't say to him, you're not 40. They didn't say to him, you're just past 30. Hmm. They said, you're not yet 50. And have you seen Abraham? So it, it suggests, it seems to imply that he could have been in his late 40s when he was, you know, preaching and teaching and had begun his ministry, right? We know that he uh, experienced over the course of that ministry at least three Passovers. We can document that between the four Gospels. Right. But there is nowhere in the Gospels that tell us you know, how old he was when he began his ministry. And in fact, there are people who say that he was born in 80, excuse me, um, 2 BC or 3 BC or this kind of thing. The real evidence suggests he was probably born between 5 and 7 BC. And it's entirely possible that his crucifixion was, you know, in his 40s or even in his early 50s, right? Because when they said that, he was still ministering. When they, when they said, you're not yet 50, we don't know how close to 50 he might have been, hmm. right? And we know he was continuing to minister for some period after that before he was 
finally crucified. So that's the first point. The other is there's nothing that says how old the Antichrist has to be. Right. That's pure speculation. Right. And Charles was identified as the Antichrist with hard evidence biblically decades ago. Right, which right. evidence that can't be made up, that can't be gainsaid, that can't be contradicted at this point. He's already running the global show behind the scenes. Okay, and let's go to the next into one of the other objections. Right. Yeah, one of the other now objections. let's go to the other point. Like some people say, well, he's not charismatic and the Antichrist has to be charismatic. Yeah. So people would typically look at Charles and think, well, I've heard he's a new ager. I've heard that he talks to plants. You know, I've heard that he's into <laughs> organic farming and organics. I've heard that he says some rather eccentric things about architecture in the United Kingdom. And who's ever going to take that guy seriously, right? Because mm -hmm. that's that's kind of the goofball persona that people tend to think just from the rumor mill mm -hmm. you know, around them and not having direct knowledge about him, not having actually read about things he said, or for that matter, ever having read even a single speech he personally has given. Without having much knowledge in this country, for example, about monarchy in general, let alone the British monarchy, you know, we're so far, we're centuries divorced, if you want to put it that way, from that here in the United States. So people don't pay a ton of attention, most people, as a matter of course, to any monarchy, uh, let alone the British monarchy, right? Yeah. And um, so they don't really know much about Charles. The reality is that he has been the number one globalist on the planet since his investiture in July 1969. Klaus Schwab has been under Charles the entire time. That's one example. Charles, uh, behind the scenes, is over the World Economic Forum. He's heavily involved through the United Nations. He's over the public-private partnership effort globally, uh, the, which is a form of fascism. You know, it's it's rolling communism, socialism, and fascism and capitalism all into one, one system that is really fascist at heart, but it's a version of fascism. He's over that effort globally through the United Nations and other entities. There are a lot of things. He's over the whole climate, the global climate agenda. He is over uh, the whole Middle East false peace process. I can go right down the line through dozens of things, and these things are documented in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. I'm not speculating on any of it. So he's been top dog among globalists this entire time. Have you heard that? Have people heard that? Have they paid attention to him? You only need to look at a few of his speeches, one or two maybe even, to be convinced there's something very different about the way this man speaks and presents and his level of knowledge and so forth. Yeah, now another, concrete, thing, mm -hmm, yeah now another mm -hmm. thing to me that's interesting is that all these world leaders who are in contact with him and are contacting him, like I just saw a few weeks ago, President Xi contacting him um, for something, you know, like something very important worldwide. So it's like, why would he contact King Charles if King Charles is just a nothing? Well, there's that. And of course, now as king, he's technically over the whole British Commonwealth, which today involves roughly a third of the global population. So you've got more than a dozen nations, I believe it is, I think it's maybe 13, don't quote me on the number, that acknowledge the British monarchy as their monarchy. And then apart from them, you've got dozens of additional nations and territories that are part of the British Commonwealth, even though they have a system that isn't uh, based on a king. You know, they don't have a, they haven't said the British monarchy is their monarchy, but nonetheless, they've joined the British Commonwealth. And the entire Commonwealth, which now encompasses roughly a third of the global population, is under Charles. It's under King Charles III. So there's that. And then, and that's a new thing. But apart from that, um, just a few examples. He delivered the first global security lecture of the global security lecture uh, series at the United Nations, which he personally initiated decades ago. He's already over the global environmental movement. I outlined some of that, including the idol that's been made to him to hail him as the environmental savior of the world, the idol that will be placed on the Temple Mount. It already exists. It's to him. It has his face. An angelic wing figure in which he's actually being portrayed as Zeus or Jupiter. And when Satan possesses him in the future, it'll be Satan, you know, in the guise of that statue, because Satan will be wearing Charles' face, you know, possessing his body. That statue will be on the Temple Mount. Satan will be showing himself, like we read in 2 Thessalonians 2. People didn't really think, people don't think a lot about this. How does Satan show himself that he is God, right? 
That's what 2 Thessalonians 2 says. The devil is going to show himself, right, that he's quote unquote God. You know, when he when he has that restrainer loosed and so forth, when the Antichrist does. How does that work exactly? Well, it's simple. The idol that's going to be put on the Temple Mount to the devil has the Antichrist face on it, and the devil is going to be inside the Antichrist body, you know, when that thing is placed there. The devil showing himself, right? So there's that. And then uh, I outlined how the United Nations exists because of Charles, but the whole global climate agenda, when we go back to COP21, and that's really when it becomes a big deal in some ways in relation to all of this, you had the largest gathering, and I did mention this in our prior interview, but I'll be quick about it. You had the largest gathering of global leadership in the whole history of the world in one place at one time ever. You know, nothing has rivaled it. I'm not even sure that the more recent COP uh, things have rivaled it. I don't think they have. Might have come close, but you had 190 plus world leaders, 150 plus actual heads of state, meaning the, the leaders of the nations themselves, the very top, like the presidents, the prime ministers, and so forth, gathered in Paris, France for COP21. You would think it would have been France's president who would have delivered the opening speech or that he would have opened it at least or something, mm -hmm. right? That he'd have been the guest of honor, if not him. Maybe Obama as the most powerful leader of the world, if not him. Maybe Al Gore. Everyone talks about Al Gore, right? And his climate agenda. They might've thought it was Al Gore who should have delivered the speech. It was none of those people. Charles opened it, not even ahead of a nation. He opened it. He delivered the first speech, and then he was in the uh, position of prominence in the group photo among all those leaders later. They were acknowledging him as being over that whole effort. The current thing that's happening in the world right now, the collapse of energy in Europe, energy systems in Europe and the United States, and before that, food, sy food systems in Sri Lanka, pushing that nation toward organic farming. Now they're trying to collapse it in the Netherlands, which is one of the major food exporters globally. Uh, by taking farmland from farmers, buying it out from them, or telling them they can't raise so many cattle or different things that are happening in the Netherlands. They're doing these same things in the United Kingdom, in Australia, now in the United States. They're That's trying right, to get it they're going doing here, it here. Right. in Canada. They already did it in Sri Lanka so that that whole nation is up in arms. Look at what happened in Sri Lanka. They were doing very well. They were growing in, in prosperity and so forth with their farming efforts and so forth by leaps and bounds. And then they get a leader in there who's actually tied to the World Economic Forum and pushes organic farming on them and says, we're not going to use synthetic fertilizers anymore. And in about two years, completely destroys their economy. People can't afford to live. They're rioting in the streets practically, and they overthrow the government. That happened in Sri Lanka. So all of that happened under Charles. It's a little microcosm of what he's trying to accomplish in the World Economic Forum under him is trying to accomplish globally with a great reset, only on a much grander scale. His personality will change when he's possessed by the devil. You know, when he's wounded, which would be the same thing Satan with the supernatural him. power. That would be the same thing when people say, well, he doesn't have supernatural power. Exactly right. So all that stuff will suddenly change like that once the great tribulation is starting at the very start of it. We're not there yet. So, in other words, it's a premature objection. And even if he doesn't have, you know, even if the devil doesn't exercise visible supernatural power through him, that will happen in a sense or seem to anyway through the false prophet, the second beast of Revelation 13. So there are two beasts in that chapter. One of them is the Antichrist, that's Charles, the foretold Antichrist who will be over the global government. The other is the false prophet who has two horns like a lamb, speaks like a dragon in that chapter, Revelation chapter 13. So he will exercise some form of power or authority that might just be military means. It might be more than that. We'll see when the time comes. It could be perceived as supernatural when the time comes, depending on what's done. But we're not there yet where the Antichrist is concerned, anything obvious, and he's not possessed by Satan yet. Now, who is this, who is the false prophet? So a lot of people have, well, some have tried to su suggest Charles could be it simply because of his age or some of these other objections, right? They look at the first interview we did and some of the evidence shown in that, and they think, he must fit in there somewhere, right? If they're not willing to accept the literal evidence. So I've seen a few instances where people have said, well, maybe he's the false prophet and William is the Antichrist or something like that, right? That doesn't work biblically. So that's not correct biblically. It's not true. But in terms of the false prophet, others have looked at the Pope. That's been a prominent suggestion 
the identity of the false prophet for decades for multiple reasons, including the mitre that the Pope might wear on his head that from the side looks like it's got two horns, that Egyptian ancient pharaoh-like uh, head piece that the Pope will wear in certain circumstances. You know, we might see from one profile, it looks like it's got a point and from the other profile, from a side profile, it might look like two horns, right? Even if people don't pay attention to that, they look at the Roman Catholic Church historically and notice that it divided into East and West, right? Two capitals, Constantinople and then Byzantium. It's for the Byzantine Empire. And then the other one under Constantinople, which Constantine was part of historically. So they'll say maybe those are the two horns, right? They look at Roman Catholicism and the Roman Catholic Church. And they think that second beast has to do with the split in the Roman Empire historically. And they'll say those might be the two horns and therefore the Pope could be the false prophet. Other things that people will say, they'll they'll look at what he says and they know that it's biblically off, that the Roman Catholic, uh, Roman Catholicism does uphold the fundamentals of the Christian faith. It so obscures them with cult-like apostate things such as a celibate priesthood, prayers to deceased saints, Marian devotions, uh, purgatory, uh, a variety of other things that are so antithetical to scripture that many Roman Catholics never dig into the Bible themselves, never come to a personal knowledge of and relationship with God themselves and don't leave Roman Catholicism because of that apostasy that continues to this day. Right, they're not encouraged to, be to read the scriptures, right. They're not. And now right. they've got a Pope who is openly endorsing macro evolution, who along with him, him and others under him are suggesting quote unquote aliens are real, that they're our space brothers. No, oh, by the way, they can be saved too, maybe through Christ's crucifixion or some other means God might have done for them. And uh, oh, by the way, we need this this new thing that we, I think we talked about it, these 10 commandments, the the climate 10 commandments and the Pope is on board with that. Right, they're on Mount Sinai, with right. Yeah, I mean, even a lot of Roman Catholics are looking at this Pope and saying, there's something very off here. He's at a minimum an apostate, if not an outright heretic. And even some of them are saying, could he end up being the false prophet? And they're questioning Roman Catholicism itself, which they should be anyway, for, for some of the reasons I mentioned, right? And going to what scripture teaches and says, and not some of these false things in Roman Catholicism, they should find a good Bible-believing church instead. They should leave Roman Catholicism. It's rotten at the top and at its core. It always has been. So that being said, People look at the Pope and they say, could he be the false prophet? And there have been times over the years when Prince Charles met privately with the Pope, even though in the British constitution, they're not allowed to have a Roman Catholic on the throne. Okay, now another objection people say, um, well, they just say, you know, you think King Charles is the antichrist, but it's just your opinion. People can say to, you, to me and they have, Tim, you're arrogant. You think you're so great or you're so important, right? To say that, how do you know it's just your opinion? I'm going to say it's not arrogant. What's arrogant is for you to think you're so knowledgeable and so important that you can actually sit there and contradict me without having examined the evidence, without having read or looked at any of it, without having compared it against scripture, without having looked at the history of Charles, et cetera. There's enough here for you to see on the, just the cover of the book alone to say, boy, I need to know more about this, right? So, so that's what's actually arrogant. And so now I'm going to say... Uh, it isn't my opinion. You want, you want to call me arrogant? Fine. I'll wear that badge. No problem. The bottom line is there's evidence and that's what I'm presenting. I'm saying, draw your own conclusion. And if you're honest and a born again Christian, the evidence will tell you that Charles is the antichrist. There isn't anybody else. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit will tell you that, particularly when you see the evidence. This isn't for me. God showed me originally and I don't, you know, you can't get along. You won't be able in the end, whoever might say something like that, to call me a false teacher or a false prophet before God. Those who would make a claim like that will find themselves either repenting or judged, one or the other, by God. So, um, again, I don't want to approach everybody and say, you know, this is a fact. I prefer to say, here's the evidence, draw your own conclusion. At the same time, it's my belief that honest, born-again Christians, actual Christians, will find that there is only one conclusion they can draw, which is that Charles is, in fact, the foretold Antichrist. And I'll leave it with one other thing here, um, Janie, on that in my response. If Charles is not 
the foretold Antichrist, hypothetically. And obviously, I'm going to say that's a false hypothetical. So I'm simply saying that for argument's sake. If he's not the Antichrist, and you believe that we're nearing the Lord's return, and therefore that the Antichrist must be alive in the world somewhere today, and you can't argue that he isn't, if you think that we're nearing the Lord's return based on the things you do see happening in the world, right? If that's your conclusion, that we're nearing the Lord's return, show me who the Antichrist is with the kind of evidence Charles has. They will not be capable of doing that. They could spend you know, their entire lifetime to their old people and die of old age, and they won't be able to do it. Not any person in history, not any person alive today, not Charles' sons, literally no other human being. And they won't be able to do it because it isn't any other human being. It's Charles. Right, because you have so much evidence. And I want people to if uh, to get your book, and the title of your book is? The, the Antichrist An and a Cup of Tea. Right, and your website, give your website. Prophecyhouse.com, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, house, H-O-U-S-E.com, run together as a single word, prophecyhouse.com. And then, of course, uh, you'll share my social media links and other things. Right, that'll be in the description and everything. Mm -hmm. But I encourage mm -hmm. everyone to listen yeah. to the first interview that we did and to get on his website and order his books because he gave us a lot of evidence, but there's way more evidence in, in his books and his um you have DVDs and CDs too. So, and his other books, I mean, there's just so much on Bible prophecy that he hasn't covered. I mean, I think it would probably would be endless interviews. So again, go to <laughs> prophecyhouse.com and we would love to have your uh, uh, comments and we would love to read what you have to say. Okay, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you, Tim.